Time have arrived Monday, May 5th. I hereby call the Finance Committee uh, 7 o'clock meeting to order. Councilors, before we get into the agenda items, just to let you know and remind you and those here in attendance and those watching on TV, uh, the City Council, the School Committee, and Mayor Carpenter will be having our joint committee this coming Wednesday at two nights, 7 o'clock. It's in regards to uh, appointing uh, a person to fill the Ward 6 School Committee because of the untimely passing of Mike uh, Healy. Originally, the thought was to have it down the hall in the GAR room. Uh, it's going to be in here, in the chamber, and it was noticed properly as such. So just to let you know, don't go down the hall, come here, okay? Thank you. Madam Clerk, number one, please. Order a transfer of 95000 from the overlay surplus fiscal year 2007 to the Police Department Personal Services Overtime. This appropriation is from the remaining balance of the overlay su surplus from the fiscal year 2007 as delivered by the assessor for fiscal year 2014 in order to fund budget shortfall. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conant, Chief Financial Officer, Robert Hayden, Interim Police Chief. Mr. Mayor, good evening. Good evening, Mr. President. Good evening, Councilors. Uh, I'll, if I could, I'll just give a brief overview to, to kind of frame this, then I'll allow Mr. Condon and Chief Hayden to answer questions. Um, this is basically a continuation of the conversation that we had at the last FinCon meeting. Uh, there was an amount of money that was identified by the assessors as an overlay uh, that meant it was now available to be reappropriated from fiscal year 2007. Um, <clears throat> there was 175,000 that went to fire department overtime. Uh, there's 75,000 <clears> that uh, you approve to go to police department overtime, and this is the remaining balance of that money of 95,000. Uh, the stated intent and purpose of this uh, funding for the police department is to provide additional patrols with the warm weather months coming up. Uh, I don't have to recount uh, some of the violence that we've experienced over the last few weeks in the city. I do believe it's a critical need to make sure that we are as staffed as possible in the city, particularly over the next few months coming up. And so that's why I'm asking you to please recommend favorably transferring this $95,000 to the police department overtime. So <clears throat> I will, um, I'll give the microphone to, uh, um, to Mr. Condon to answer question on the finances and Chief Hayden is also here to respond to questions regarding the, uh, the utilization of the funds. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilors, any questions for Mr. Cornyn? Any questions for the uh, chief? Any questions for the mayor? I entertain a motion. Move to approve. Mo Second. Motion was made, properly seconded. In favor of recommendation back to the full city council. Agenda item number one. All in favor, raise your hands, please. All opposed, raise your hands. Motion carries. Mr. President. Councilor. I'd like to make a motion to take numbers um, not, um, nine out of order. Second. Motion was made, properly seconded. Take agenda item number nine out of order. All in favor of that motion, raise your hand. Raise your hands. All opposed, motion carries. Number nine, please. Resolved that the police chief, Robert Hayden, be invited to appear before the Finance Commission to discuss and provide an update on his first 60-day emergency appointment as chief of the Brockton Police Department. Any changes to officer assignments and structure he has already made and his plans for his second 60-day emergency appointment invited Robert Hayden, interim chief of police. Good evening, chief. How are you, How are you tonight? I'm okay. Good. What's who's, the question? Whose resolve is this? It's mine resolve. Council. Um, hello, Chief Hayden. How are Hi. you? Good, Councilwoman. I would like, um, I'm just wondering if you'll um, tell us exactly what the ordinance, what the resolve says. Um, the Finance Commission, that you appear before the Finance Commission to discuss and provide an update on your first 60-day appointment as Chief of Brockton Police Department, any changes in officer assignment and structure that you've already made, and your plans for your second emergency appointment that you're in right now. Uh, Councilor, in, if I may, Philip uh, Nasrallah from the Law Department. I've discussed this particular uh, resolve with Chief Hayden and I've advised them to give an overview, broad overview, as to what the essence of the inquiry is. However, to refrain from uh, specifying anything about assignments, personnel assignments, because I think we get into an area, when we talk about personnel, it, uh, we would be breaching certain obligations 
and requirements that we may or may not have. So that's probably the only area I would ask deference of the council on not to make inquiry of. Sure, I don't know what you mean by obligations. And well, it could be, for instance, a demotion. That's okay. a, a change, and we couldn't be discussing that. There could be an assignment over to undercover, and we couldn't be discussing that. So that's just two off the top of my head. There may be others. I just think that one sentence of inquiry should be uh, stricken, at least for the purpose of this evening. Don't we see that in the budget books, though, where people are assigned, or no? I'm just wondering. No, for, for what my concern is, again, Maybe, maybe you could follow up uh, with us city councilors with a table of organization. And That's then you fine. don't have to discuss them right now. And we'll just be able to see that public document um, via email. That's fine. That, that would be good. So just, just, you know, everything else, I would love to hear about the great work that you're doing. Huh. Thank you. Is that it? No, you're not. I don't think that you're, you're supposed to give an update to us. Um, it's, this is what I'm asking you. Um, and I think that us as a, when I say we, I think this is what the city council and the people at home that I've spoken with okay. would like to know. Um, we'd like an update on um, what okay. you've done in the first 60 day appointment and then um, what you plan to do in your current 60 okay. day appointment. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Where I'm reluctant to talk about specifics is because we're in live television and I don't want people that may not be the nice people in Brockton to know where I'm assigning my men and who's in what assignment and how many detectives I have on a given time. Sure. So that, but my, my update. Tell us what you tell the newspaper, you know, let's, yeah. let's hear what you're doing. That's great. My update is that I've, uh, I'll, at the risk of sounding uh, cocky, uh, morale has improved tremendously. Um, number of arrests have gone up. Um, the men have decided, uh, under my urging, uh, that quality of life crimes are more important than they were valued before. Um, these are the people I'm talking about that, um, these aren't the major drug dealers and the uh, shooters. These are the people that uh, prohibit nice people from walking down the street without being afraid. There's going to be a, a, a large push to uh, uh, control those people and remove them from the streets when they're committing crimes. Um, it's a wagon on the street now that takes calls that didn't before. Uh, there are several motorcycles, possibly eight, that are going to go through the city, not waiting for a 911 call, but actually looking for a crime. They'll be uh, led by a supervisor on a motorcycle and with a wagon following behind. And the way it's worked in all the times that have done this in the past, sends a very strong message to the people who are hoping for change and care about the city that there's something different has happened. Um, I've allowed them to wear different, uh, more comfortable uniforms uh, on their details. I've allowed them to wear their vests on the outside of their uniforms because they, uh, according to the men that I've talked to, they're uncomfortable when they're inside, when the shirt goes over them. Uh, I just think it's, uh, I'll take the opportunity to say that uh, I'm the luckiest 72-year-old uh, chief in the country. I'm probably the, might only, be the only one. I'm the only one. Yeah. And the reason I'm so lucky is because the people that I inherited here are fantastic. They, they, they were great way before I got here. Yep. Uh, you have an incredibly uh, motivated, energetic, professional police department. Um, so I'm just happy that I'm going to be around them for about a year. Sure. So uh, when you say the number of arrests have gone up, what do you what do you mean by that? How do you quantify that? Could you send us a report on that? Us sure. uh, meeting the city yeah. council. I think we'd love to see that. Okay. What kind of information would be in that report? Uh, the person that was arrested, the date. Uh, what he was arrested for, or he or she. I'd like to send you another report saying that after they went to court, they didn't come back again on the street so quickly, but that's another venue that I have nothing to do with. Exactly, exactly. So I would love to get that report um, yeah. talking about that and maybe a similar report for the same time the year before so we can get a good sense of how they've gone up 
and in what areas that um, your team and our team, as you know, we all support the Brockton Police Department, right. how, that's, um, how that's focusing. Sure. So do you think you'd be able to send that along when you get a moment, or is there someone else that I should contact <laughs> about that? I'll, I'll uh, delegate that out. I would someone. love that. Thank okay. you so much. Make nice uh, bedtime reading. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's very interesting because we get a lot of calls from residents and it's always good to yeah. know what our police officers are doing and it's well, good to be able to tell them yeah. that this is what, what the people that protect us Michelle, as you, you remember the last the shooting at the Lit, you called me and asked for walking people. So this is a little update on what we did. Um, Thank you. We, we took the... Uh, we sneaked the walking beat away from the downtown and sent them down to you for three days or four days. And we had all of our officers take their calls from your, uh, the village area and then did walk and talks in that area. So we have sort of a flexible police department that can respond quickly uh, to any part of the city. And um, I'm very proud of them. Oh, and so am I. So I really appreciate what you're doing. And after um, that that murder, I know that you were extremely helpful. And I really appreciate the reinstatement of the walking beats. Yeah. Um, and I know that when that had happened the previous year, the residents told me they were really happy about it. Yeah. And I've actually been approached by multiple business owners that they are really grateful that right. they are back. And they Good. see a difference. Good. So. That is great. Um, and when you talk about quality of life crimes, yeah. what do you mean by that? I mean, uh, uh, you, a woman wants to go to the store and buy a bottle of milk. And she should be able to do that and make it back safely. Sure. She should not be approached by Johns who mistake her for a hooker. Exactly. That's a quality of life crime. Yep. Uh, a person walking down the street on the sidewalk shouldn't be shouldn't feel afraid if there's a gang of people out in front of a certain bar yep. that he has to walk in the street and maybe get hit by a car. That's a quality of life crime. Quality of life, quality of life crime is anything that makes just regular people uncomfortable and afraid. Um, loud music, uh, you know, you're trying to put your kids to sleep and there's a car two doors down blasting away. Uh, that's a quality of life crime. Those things aren't as important as murders, but in a way, they're more important. It's the broken windows theory that sure. Billy Bratton coined. It's that when you take care of the small things, it, the, the bigger things sort of fall into place. Yep, I read that book, I own that book. I think it's a great, a great way to go yeah. about it. Um, so good for you and thank you. You're welcome. Um, so does that mean that the focus of the police department in some ways is gonna be more on John's and because I think that that is a big issue that we're having, um, you know, predators and semi-predators yeah. coming into the city just for that one purpose. Yeah. And that kind of makes everybody feel uncomfortable. Oh, it should. And, and the, 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 the biggest victims in the whole thing are the poor prostitutes. They're, yeah. dr they're drug addicts. That's how they're, I see um, it. You know, being run by a pimp more than likely. And uh, I, I really don't feel that the man that comes into town or lives here and uses them should be able to skate. He, his name should be in the newspaper, in my opinion. I agree. As bad as that's going to be for his happy little family, uh, that's going to dissuade people from coming in and doing that. Uh, so I, I, I think that's a, that's a quality of life crime. The, I'm totally in agreement with you, and I'm actually working with quite a few people that are talking more and more about um, sex slaves and sex trade yeah. and how that may be functioning in the city. And um, there have been issues where a person on... Um, Mulberry Street has seen quite often different women with no shoes on uh, and having a John driving driving a bicycle up behind her kind of selling her yeah. to the people that are coming in and right. out and there's a lot of thought that there is some sex trade uh, going on here now would you think that there that is ha a problem in Brockton I, I think once these women get addicted to uh, heroin and other drugs they'll do anything to keep their habit going yep. and the, the, the either the pimps or themselves they're desperate, they'll do anything. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of that is happening. And then motorcycles, when did the motorcycles start? Did we, where did we get those motorcycles from? We, leased them, we leased them from a, a police uh, lease, motorcycle leasing uh, company in uh, um, New Hampshire. Uh, and they're in the garage now, there are eight of them. They're gonna be uh, lettered and um, registered 
and they should be out in the, well, the, well I have to put the people through a class. Yep. There's a class that the criminal justice uh, uh, division is putting on. Uh, they're given, it's free, they're gonna do it for nothing. They train us for a week, even though some of them already have motorcycle licenses, they'll train them, and then out they go. Uh, so they're very close to being a reality right now. They were trucked down from uh, New Hampshire by the company. And I think it's gonna be a very, very important um, um, part of the, uh, the fight that we're in. Great. I really do. Well, thank you. I'm gonna, at this point, open it up to if my fellow counselors have questions of you. Okay. And then if you don't mind staying there, I'm gonna try to take your next item out of order as well so we can get you go on your way. Okay. Thank you, Council. Council Stewart. Great. Uh, Chief Hayden. Hi, Jace. Yeah. Uh, great, good to see you. Good to see uh, you. I really appreciate what you're doing so far. I've only, I've only heard uh, great feedback from the patrolmen in the city, uh, and I try my best to stay grounded by just talking to folks who are doing the work, and I haven't heard a single complaint about your work, and even more importantly, I've only heard praise. I do have a couple questions for you. Yes, sir. Uh, so this idea that morale is higher, so how yeah. do you measure that beyond sort of anecdotal conversations well, with folks? I'm in a, I'm in a bit of a... Um, an uncomfortable place here because we have a former chief here and I'm not trying to say that morale is higher than we, he was here. Uh, it was sky high then because I know that because I used to come down here from Boston when the chief was here with Boston gang units and, and go to the uh, Brockton Fair and identify the gang members that just left Boston. So I, I was impressed with the morale here before. Uh, so anything I say is not in comparison with anyone else. But the way I know when a department has high morale is when there's a call and two or three cruisers show up to back each other up. A department with low morale, you'll have the one car show up and everybody else is off doing what they want to do uh, uh, and, and not involved in the, in the entire plan. There's a plan here, it's in place and everyone knows what it is and everyone is participating. Um, it, some departments that are lethargic, the cruisers will ride around and wait for a call. When they get the call, they go. Then they clear the call after a certain amount of time. Hopefully it's a, a, a quick amount of time. But in a department that's a bit um, slow motion, uh, they take their call and then they wind up um, lollygagging somewhere. Uh, our department, what they do is they take their call, several cruisers show up, and then they go to areas that are potential problems where no call has come in yet, and they'll stay in that area. They'll do FIOs there. They'll, uh, they'll get out of the car and walk in those areas. So what we have here is a very highly motivated department now, and I say now, maybe they were before, maybe I have influenced morale, I hope I have. Another way that I try to do it is by showing up in, on the street. Uh, there are some departments like, you know, small town departments and some other departments where the chief can stay in the office and not be seen. You can't do that here. They have to see the chief on the street here. I, you, you all remember that intensely grotesque face when I fell down the mountain? That horrible face with all the blood and... I made sure that I came to work the next day and went out on the street with the men so that they would never have the nerve to say, Oh, I can't come in today, Chief. I twisted my pinky. So morale starts at the top, <laughs> and it goes right down to the bottom. Right. When I did come in and, and, and answered calls with them that period when it was killing me, I mean, that, they respected that. They came up and uh, told me that. So that's how I measure morale. What do they do in between calls? How energetic are they? Do you hear them laughing? Are they kidding with one another? Are they having fun, actually? I mean, we are. They're having fun. They're doing their jobs. They're doing what they wanted to do since they were little kids. And they're having a great time doing it. And they're really cleaning up your streets for you. I wish I could have been here 10 years ago. I would have stayed here 10 years. Mm -hmm. I, I am very lucky to have dropped into this department with the quality of, of uh, offices that you have. I'll thank Chief Studinsky for, for willing them to us for a while. Mm -hmm. He had to have a lot to do with it. It's good to know. And just for a bit of protocol, I, I, I usually, in fact, I always refer to folks by their title in this forum. I expect the same. I prefer to be called Counselor Stewart and not by my first name in this forum, uh, Chief Hayden. My other question. Time out. Did I just get a zing? 
<laughs> yes, you did. Okay. <laughs> okay. Accepted. Yeah. Um, the motor, the motorcycle, um, that whole, that whole operation, which I'm assuming is costing, and this may, um, well, I'm hoping the president will give me a little bit of latitude here. Um, that that initiative, I'm a, that's obviously costing us more. Uh, that's costing additional money. Though I understand we're still within the same budget that was approved from last for for this fiscal year. Um, but what is the thought moving forward on that strategy into the next fiscal year? Have you guys thought that through it yet? I, no? I would like to see them continue on through all the summer months, and then as it gets cooler and crime starts to abate, um, and then we can take them off the road. I think they're mostly, uh, their greatest value is from now until probably uh, October or November. Mm -hmm. okay. They're at least for a year. I see. Great. And then my last question is uh, around your, your one-year opportunity to, I'm not sure if the phrase is to restructure the department, but look at where there are, I mean, I'm assuming you've done some type of gap analysis, what's working, what isn't working, and you're making some reforms within this year, um, which, and I understand you're not being able to discuss what that looks like publicly. Yeah. Uh, this may go back to item two that's on the agenda when we discuss the new uh, contract for the police, but um, I did ask the mayor in, in, in a previous um, committee meeting to come back with uh, a quick analysis of what we're spending on, um, the, I, guess, I guess what you call the top brass and then the, the patrolmen. And what I got back was a, a little surprising because I hadn't, hadn't before thought about looking at the budget this way. So when I look at the numbers that were presented to me, we're spending, it looks like about 40% of the dollars on the lieutenants, captains, and above. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other 60% is for the rest of the patrol person. I, I don't know if that's accurate. I haven't seen those figures. But I, I can tell you this, that I'm doing my part. I'm getting $50,000 a year. For well, the, no, for, well, it's, I understand so. that. But my, I would, and these numbers may not be totally accurate, and maybe I'm not reading them um, accurately, but that will be a question that I have, okay. particularly in the next budget cycle is, Okay. What are we, where are we spending our money and are we spending it in a way that is um, seen as a reasonable way to sort of balance those different numbers and what you guys are doing about it? Okay. Okay? Yep. Great. Well, thank you for your service. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, Don't thank call you. me boy. Uh, yes. Actually, I think this question is for the mayor. Um, is it okay if I ask him a question, even though he's yes. not invited on this? Yep. Mr. Mayor? There's been a lot of talk about the rental of the new uh, motorcycles. Mm -hmm. And Council Stewart actually just mentioned something about um, paying for them and, and mm -hmm. how to sustain that. Would some of this additional money that you asked for in item one and the forthcoming money that you'll be asking for, will that, is that some of the some Some of the money in item, to? some of the money in item one is earmarked for the cost of officers riding the motorcycles for the labor costs of putting officers on the motorcycles. The cost of the motorcycles themselves was out of existing funds in the budget. That was not a request for additional money. I think if Captain Williamson can help me, it's like 3900 a year, or what, how much was it? Uh, how much was the cost of the annual lease? Uh, 30, I think it's uh, 32. 32. Yeah, it's about 3200 for one year to lease one motorcycle. <laughs> it's a one-year lease with an option to lease a second year. And that's actually a standard contract that's negotiated through the state, through the state procurement laws. They're already an approved vendor at a rate that's negotiated at the state level, so we're able to purchase at the state level through a pre-approved contract. So we don't have to put it out to bid if it's an approved vendor at the state level already. Okay, so it's $3,200 per bike, right? and there are eight new bikes. Six. Okay, eight, Chief... eight includes two that we have existing. We own two right now. Oh, so, okay, so, so 32 it's six. plus six. two for a total of eight, yeah. And that's for the year? For the year. Oh, for the season? For the year. So I, I think that the, the intent of some of the overtime patrol money is so that we can have some extra help in the warm weather months to put officers on those motorcycles without taking them out of a cruiser or taking them off of a walking beat that would actually be additional patrols at critical time of the year and critical times of the day. So with the wagon and the cruisers and bikes? 
Well, the, in other words, the cruisers are out there anyhow. The cruisers are on patrol, but the idea right. is... Right, no, I, I know, but you said the additional, the, the bikes will be additional. So it'll be wagons, cruisers... One wagon, the cruisers that are already on the road, the wagon. and the motorcycles in addition. Right. Okay, so that's the overtime. That's the addition. Right. In other words, I, I don't think, and again, this is more strategy on the part of the chief. I'm not the law enforcement professional, but the, the philosophy was if you park a car and take the officer out of the car and stick him on a motorcycle and drive him around, we really haven't gained any coverage. Right. So the idea is to fund some additional patrols during the warm weather months at critical times by being able to put officers on the motorcycles without taking them out of a car. Okay, and actually, Chief Hayden, if I could ask yeah. you a couple of questions about If this. I could just, quick one clarification to Council Stewart's question. It was sergeants and up on the brass. Sergeants are included in that, and there are 20 sergeants included in that. Thank you. Good evening, Chief. Hi, I'm not gonna call you Shana, but I wanna tell you that uh, <laughs> the wagon is already here. The wagon was here when I got here. Mm -hmm. That's not included in any, there's no additional charge for the wagon. Right. It's just getting out more. That's going to go Invisible. up with the Okay. Um, with the motorcycles, how many current officers are trained and, and ready to go on these We put cycles? out a uh, um, request for people that are going to uh, go on the motorcycles. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there are probably, I'd say there are maybe between eight and 10 that are already uh, have motorcycle licenses and are trained. But I'm gonna send everyone through this school. The people that have never ridden before, might be a couple of them, the people that are proficient. Because it's a very, very, and it's free, very important um, uh, school. Okay, so that'll, that will allow you to um, potentially have a, a bigger force or a bigger department available to you to go out on the bikes on these overtime yeah. positions. Okay, Yeah. great. Thank you. Okay. All set, Council? I'm all set. Thank you. Council, does anybody else go back to Council Dubois? Thank you. Hi, Chief. Hi. So now that it's come up, so, so the total of eight bikes is 256 or eight? Six. There's uh, six that we're leasing, and there's two that are already uh, here. Okay. Hold are on our uh, vehicular uh, uh, list. So that's $196,000. Cost. Oh, the, there's two motorcycles that you own right now. Cost yeah. is 19,200. 19,200 a year times 19, six. 19,200. So it isn't, I thought you said, how much is it to rent, to lease it a year? It's 3,200 uh, 3, or something. 3,200, I'm sorry, so I had an extra. So 19,600. Yeah, I guess. And what line item did that come out of? I think it's coming out of the regular overtime budget at this point in time, uh, but it will be augmented with if you're kind enough to uh to uh anybody that's smarter than i am want to come up you here? might have a I'm, so, I'm sorry yeah i handle the budget issues I, I don't have the numbers for the bikes here i wasn't i, I, I believe it's going to be like about you. thirty-two thousand for the year for the bikes whatever total thirty-two thousand dollars for the year of the bikes for six bikes for the yes um I'm actually planning on paying that out of the uh, drug forfeiture money from, from uh, cases that are closed through the DA's office. That was my intention. How much money do, you get, do we get from that, the drug forfeiture money? It varies uh, depending on the, the case that comes in. Give me any year. What was last year's or this year's or where are um, we now? We might get 30000 in a year. Okay. Um, there's, there's money in there now. Uh, that. Last I checked, it was about 70-something thousand, but we're using that to, 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 to make purchases. So it might be about 65,000 in there right now. So when you say 32,000 for the six bikes, does that include the registration or just the lease? Are you, because that, that, that is for the lease. Just for the lease. For the lease. So that's around $5,000 a bike or? I, I, I don't know the exact that's figures. What it seems I, like I, when I knew I'm doing what the, the end math. amount was going to be. Captain, the yeah. difference is the equipment, it's the bike and then the yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't have the dollar amounts Fine. in front of me. Uh, there's money that's going to go to equip the offices. They need boots, and just, so, we're sure. going to take that out of our regular budget. That makes sense that it would all go together. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council, is there any other questions? Council Dubois, are you, are you? I'd like to move this favorably. Second. Motion was made. Properly seconded. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, raise your hand. 
All opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Mr. Council, President, you want to do number 10, right? I would like to take number 10 out of order. Is there a second? second. Thank Thank you. Motion made, properly second to take number 10 out of order. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, motion carries. Madam Clerk, number 10, please. Resolved that the police chief, Robert Hayden, be invited to appear before the Finance Commission to discuss any and all limitations placed on his ability to work more than 960 hours per year, pursuant to the General Law, Chapter 32, Section 91, B and C. Invited Robert Hayden, Interim Chief of Police, Martin S. Brophy, Treasurer, Tax Collector, Philip Nazarella, City Solicitor, Maureen Cruz, Personnel Director. Mr. President. I filed this resolve um, because I have my own questions. Um, I've spoken with uh, the attorney for Brockton's retirement board and had some conversations with him and uh, maybe asking him to appear before the council to talk about um, his interpretation of this law. But I first wanted to hear what um, the city was doing to fulfill um, this requirement. So, um, Ms. Cruz, if you'll just explain. Um, the, the Mass General Law dictates that it's the treasurer that's supposed to report these numbers. That's what it says in writing. So has the city um, chosen you instead? or Which section states it's, that the it's treasurer? It's right here. It says Mass General Law. I actually highlighted the portion in the actual um, resolve that I filed. And I actually copied and pasted it, so I'm not sure. I'm happy to look it up on my phone, but I did send it as a hard copy, so I will do actually, that right Counselor, now. Actually, Councillor, I have 91 A, B, and C okay, with me. Okay, it's within B or C. Well, I know it's true, so I mean, it, the city can choose to designate someone else. Um, is that what the city has done? Who who reports? Do the do does the chief? report his hours to you, and do you make sure that these laws are followed? Or who does that in Brockton? The chief reports his hours to, the, to his administrative assistant at the police department for payroll purposes. Those are processed through the payroll system and paid to him. Personnel department is also ca uh, monitoring the hours to make sure that he does not exceed 960 hours. But in accordance with Mass Who is doing that? I'm sorry. Mr. Hay P police Chief Hayden is providing his hours to the administrative assistant at the police department for payroll purposes. Those are being paid to him on a weekly basis, and the personnel department is also monitoring the hours to watch for the cap of the 960 hours. And how are you, how are you doing that? Reviewing the payroll. Okay. And so where do we stand right now? He has not even reached 400 hours. He's under 300. And are, um, to your knowledge, are the hours that are being reported all the hours that he's working? I, to the best of my knowledge, yes. Great. I think that's important with my conversation with the retirement board attorney. It seemed like to be an important point. Um, so you've taken, I've, I've found it. So. Um, here we go. It uh, is so one, one second. Ms. Cruz was going to tell us what the total number. Do you have that n number? 300 and something you said? 322. 322, counselors. Thank you. Oh, I thought you said 400. So thank you for I said he was under, under 400. It's 322. 322. Um, and so I, I'll just read it to you. It's Mass General Law, Chapter 32, Section 91C. Each person referred to in paragraph B shall cert certify to his employer and the treasurer or person responsible for the payment of the compensation for the position in which he is employed, the number of days or hours which he has been employed in any such calendar year, and the amount of earnings therefrom. And if the number of hours exceeds 960 in the aggregate, he shall not be employed, or if the earnings therefore exceed the amount allowable under paragraph B, he shall return to the appropriate treasurer or other person responsible for the payment of the compensation of any such person. That, so uh, chapter uh, 91C of section chapter 32 section 91C. That's what it says. No, it's, that's what it that's says. Incorrect. I copied it and pasted it and I got it sent to me by a retirement attorney. So why don't we look it up? Because that's what it says. So you've never read this. Is that what you're I've saying? I printed, Councillor. So I never, have. I have also printed them. I didn't cut and paste. I printed so them you've from. Never, so you've never. You've never. I've heard never. Of I've the, never read sentence. the word treasurer. Okay. So in, I, w I will send it to you because that is what it says. Well, cut and paste. I will that consult with says. the city attorney. And I will and say that if Mass General laws, because I don't it, see the word treasurer in there. 
if it is um, that, I think it's a problem that you don't realize that, first off. But I will look into that, because it was summed to me by multiple people, and I had to, it was easy to find it. But in any event, so what you're saying is the person that's responsible for making sure that these hours are reported appropriately is, is the his employee. administrative assistant. His employ he, as the employee, is responsible to report his hours to the re appropriate retirement board that he is collecting his pension from. So it says um, each person referred to in paragraph B shall certify to his employer and the treasurer or other person responsible for payment of compensation. So you're saying that that is somehow circumvented because um, you Counselor, have- what I'm saying is there's a there is a dispute. What we are reading right now, the city solicitor and myself, section chapter 32, nine, C does not have the word treasurer in it. That's what okay. I'm saying to you. I say it does. So in any event, let's get clear what actually happens instead of fighting about something that really doesn't make any sense. So if you will tell me exactly how the, not, the hours of the police chief are reported, just one more time, and who's responsible for reporting them for payment, I would. so you're saying that he reports them to his assistant, and his assistant reports them to who? To the pay payroll clerk to pay to them payroll. out of the police department. Those are submitted to the auditor's office to be paid. And the personnel department is also monitoring the number of hours. Okay. So you're saying that if this is in fact what it says, and I will be asking a retirement attorney to come in to talk to that, you're going to have to reassess, or do you think even under this you would just, you would just designate the employee's assistant to be the person um, legally responsible. At, at this point in time, Counselor, until we can clarify the law, I can't answer that question. Oh, great. After this, we'll just postpone it, and that will be fine with me if my fellow counselors will agree so we can just get to the bottom of it because I just want to make sure that we're managing everything appropriately. I'm a big advocate for transparent government and government that's good and follows the law, so I appreciate you Certainly, being Counselor. Here. That's what I do on a daily basis. Oh, counselor, are you making too. a motion to postpone? I'm actually, I would like to speak with the Chief. Can I interject something? Of course you can. That particular section you read is not from 91C. It, I'm sure it's a, maybe a valid section of a chapter, but it's not that particular chapter. But I, I would like the council to be aware that what you're stating, in, and I, I compliment your uh, concern for the oversight, the greatest concern of that oversight would be Chief Hayden himself, because if he were to exceed that amount of hours, he himself would be jeopardizing his standing with the retirement board. So, he probably is going to be the chief monitor and the one who has the most serious concern as to what his hours are that are logged in. That may be, but what the law says, I just want to make sure that we're following what the law says. Understood. So when that time comes, if it does come, it wasn't just another, um, we didn't realize that this was our responsibility. I'm going to wash my hands of it and move on. I want to make sure that there is accountability in city government. And right now, I'm seeing the accountable person is the treasurer or the person responsible for the payment of the compensation. So I also want to make sure that Treasurer Brophy is aware that under state law, in my reading of it, he is responsible unless the city has designated someone else. And I would never want an employee of the city to think that they're not responsible and then something happened and come to find out he is and there's some kind of retribution or some kind of mark on his record because he was told not to do something that obviously to me he's supposed to do. Well, that's a fair concern. What I would yeah. ask is your, your deference to allow the law department to examine that as well so we can determine what the appropriate chapter and section is relegating that particular uh, function. Sure, and I'll I appreciate that. I'll be happy that. to do that. Oh, so you asking for a legal opinion on that matter? I am asking for, okay. thank you for that help. I am asking for a legal opinion on that matter. I appreciate it. Okay, fine. And then Chief Hayden, if you wouldn't mind just coming on up for a second. I first want to start out with saying that I think you're great. I yep. know a lot of people who say that you're Sorry, wonderful. Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. What? I do think you're great. I, <laughs> do. Was that? I didn't I hear you. Doubt. 
I think the city is lucky to have you. I yeah. personally think that you should be here as a consultant and the city should have a full-time chief for only $5,000 more. I think it would be a better utilization of your intellect and also capacity building for the city because then we would be opening up more money for, for below you um, boots on the ground. But that isn't what's being decided because the city council has tabled that. I think that it was a mistake, but that's what they've done and there's nothing I can do about it. But what I'd like to know is, have, of course you've read the retirement law, being a law enforcement officer yourself, and know much more about mass general laws than I'm sure I do, and I can totally understand that. But I've gotten a lot of calls from pensioners that are extremely concerned, and these are the people that I represent in Ward 6, so I can't ignore their concerns, and I refuse to, that they are concerned that we have a person in this position, and it's no personal um, vendetta, or has no personal relevance on you, because they all think you're doing a great job, but we have a person in this position that's only supposed to work 960 hours, and I want to know how you're going to be able to do a full-time chief's job. So I am just, I am a nonprofit administrator, and I say just, it's an important job, and I do fundraising, but it's not necessarily as important as a police officer because you're out there saving people's lives. And I work 60 hours a week on salary. So, you know, a police chief, I'm thinking, when I sit back, is working more than 60 hours on salary, if not 80. So how are you completing this gigantic task in what amounts to half time, 18 hours through a, a week? Through a superhuman effort that relies on 40 or 45 years of incredibly detailed police work and procedures, and being a person who was born to be a police officer and who loves to make cities like yours um, better. Uh, it's not easy. I don't know if you could find a 45-year-old person to do what I'm doing here. And if you think that I've done a good job, I've only used up about 300 of my hours so far. And I, I have a question for you. The time that I'm here tonight, is that being deducted from my pot? I would say yes. Oh, that's but been... That, get, but I'm not your boss because get me I'm out of here the then. administrator. Get me out of here and let me go on this. <laughs> that's why we took you first. That's why we took it, you Because I would say this is a ridiculous use of my hours. No, but honestly, it's not. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm kind of offended by that That's statement, not, uh, to be honest. Let's keep it on track. Oh, of course. Absolutely. I wasn't taking it off. No, I didn't say you were. Thank you. Thank you. I just want you I guess to know that, means I, was. that I respect right. what you do. I really do. And I think that you should respect what we do because we're, do. we are elected by the people. Tell me what and the no question is. no one is your enemy. We're all in support. I have family in law enforcement. I think very highly of police officers and people that put their lives on the line for yeah. me and my neighbors. So there shouldn't be any type of animus or thought Negative. that we I agree don't with support you. you 100%. What's the question? I have multiple questions. Huh. So. If you're, how many hours a week are you working? How many hours did you work last week? It varies. Week? It varies. It's between 18 and 21. Okay. And so how are you going, so you're, how many hours? You've worked 360 hours so far in your two 60-day um, appointments around, right? That's what, the, that's what the personnel department has for you. So have you reported every hour that you've worked? Stand by. 322. Sure. Have you reported every hour you've worked? Probably not. No. Okay. I think it's important that you do. Oh, I do too. I mean, they're, 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 they're accounted for and they're ready to be reported. It's not that they're being, um, you know, hidden or shuffled off somewhere. But I, I've, been very, very, I've been very, very busy uh, doing kind of other things here. And uh, I'm keeping track of them. I'm uh, giving them to the appropriate person, but uh, they haven't really been on the, uh, the most important thing I've tried to do since I got here, but I will do a better job if you think. Well, this is what I think. I think I want a full-time lead enforcement officer in the police department. That's what I want, and yeah. I think that's what the people I represent want, and we'd love well, it to be you. Just let me finish. We yeah. would love it to be you. 
And unfortunately, because of these ridiculous laws that none of us can change, you're in this conflict. Can I tell you, may I tell and you I, something? Just one more second. I just want to make sure, because when I spoke with the yep. retirement lawyer, he said that if you were to get injured or you were to um, perform an act of a police officer while you were on non-assigned time or yeah. you're, you know, volunteering, that could be a liability for us. Wouldn't be so, because the reason it wouldn't be is because I would just go home and get stitched up and come right back to work. Yeah. I have devoted the last year of my working life to your city. I have given a pledge to myself that I will do every single thing I can to make this city safe. And to be honestly, quite honest with you, not no present company uh, included, if you followed most police chiefs around, you would go to the golf club, you'd go to, to find them, um, you would find them in their office. Uh, the time that I'm putting in here is concentrated, it's intense, and it's worth it's worth what most police chiefs do in a week. Well, and, and I have no doubt that maybe you're correct. I don't know. I've only known a couple of police chiefs in my life. Yeah, and they're, they're both the good ones. extremely hard workers, so yes, I don't know if you'd be sure. accurate on that, but I didn't follow them around, to be honest no. with you. No. Well, I'd like you to I follow. Believe, I'd like, I invite you to follow me around. And come well, into the station and go out with me. I believe that, the, and I have done drive arounds before with police officers um, with the bulletproof vest and going in, and it was exciting. Yeah. But um, that's part of the reason why I think that there is sex trafficking in the city, because one of my visits had carve outs of the basement bathroom door and locked from the outside. But that's a different story that we're not here to talk about right now. What we're here to talk about is part of my being a good government politician. Yeah. So I'm in my ninth year of serving the city, yeah. and I've lived here my whole life. So maybe my care and devotion to the city, I'm not saying Trump's yours, because no. I would never be so rude, but deep down in my heart, I was born here. I'm now serving the city as an elected official. I take more than 40 hours of my week out for a $10,000 salary to do my best of what I can do for my neighbors and my friends. And I'm going to live here. I live here now. I pay taxes. And I, let's hope I never die. But if I do, I bet I'll be buried here. So my, so we shouldn't be judging who's more dedicated, because we're both dedicated. I'm not but the doing law that. says 960 hours. Yeah. And I just want everybody at home and you to know that I think that that law should be followed because I'm a good government politician. We shouldn't be turning a blind eye. We turned a blind eye to the, and I'm not suggesting that you, I think you're a high moral character. Thank you very you much. But you make laws for everybody. You don't make, and we know this, you don't make laws that only the bad people have to follow. And you know this as a police officer. Mm -hmm. You make blanket laws and good people and bad people have to follow them. And sometimes good people break the law and you have to tell them, mm -hmm. hey, you're breaking the law. So so the law was made for 960 hours, and what I'm hearing on the street is that you'll be a part-time chief for full-time pay. Part-time chief. There's a lot of there's a lot of rumor mongering out there, mm. both um, in support of you and in opposition to anybody that asks any questions of this issue. But I'm a good government politician, and so I can't be pushed down just by vicious attacks on my character. Just when I'm trying to have a person follow what Mass General Law says they have to follow. I, I believe, just like the building superintendent, I didn't think he should get a break. I don't think people that don't follow the rules, no matter what we think of them, I don't think they should get a break. So I just want to make sure that we all know that all these rumors that say you're going to be a full-time chief for part-time pay are not true. Am I correct? Are they true or are they not true? Are you here full-time, working full-time for part-time pay? He's working 960 hours for the year. But so that means you're not working full time for part time pay, correct? Councillor, I, I, I think it's a yes or no answer. No, I don't think it is. Because okay. I think we're clear that we are going. I, I I understood the impetus of your concern, which is a legitimate concern, is that he's following whatever the statutory scheme is for reporting. That I said I would examine what the applicable statute is from the general laws and report back to you on that, and that Chief Hayden comport to that particular scheme. 
Could you please give me a legal opinion on what the different definition of full-time employment is, please? Absolutely. I would, like, I would like that through the chair for you to give that definition, because I think that that should be an easy answer, especially when I am consistently being bombarded by people that are attacking my character based on this full-time work for part-time pay PR that is ridiculous. Because what we're talking about are two people that want what's best for the city, and someone of these two people being attacked because they don't want to break the law. And what's so crazy is this is in the context of the police department. The police department that's set up to follow the rules. Police officers that are held to a higher standard because they carry the gun, they carry the badge, and they really bring order to the city. So Can I, I say something, please? Yes, of course. In the remaining 600 hours or whatever I have left, I'm going to get every single that I can, rapist, murderer, thug, bum, pimp, hooker, and drug dealer off your streets. That's I'll great. look at my watch to make sure I'm not on my own time, and then I'll go home after, as soon as I have to. But in the, in the six or 700 hours that I have left, I'm going to clean your city up. I'm going to make it safer than it was before I got here. And I'll keep an eye on my time while I'm doing it. And I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. And you know what? We'll be calling you back, or I will oh, be good. filing good. it. Because I think that what's happening is there's some scheme to keep having you emergency interim appointed instead of just settling the issue for the taxpayers of the city that want to have a, a permanent police chief in yeah. place? Well, you know that I said I'm only staying here a year. I know. And, and we I think have I have about 10 months left. So if we all just, you know, grit our teeth and hang on, it'll be over pretty soon. Well, the thing is, that would be five more temporary appointments, and I have a different piece of resolve filed to have the law department come in, because my reading of that general law that the mayor is utilizing to appoint you temporarily, in my reading, it says that he can only do it once. So I'm hoping that there's some kind of case law that says that he can do it more than once. And again, this isn't a personal thing. I just want people to follow the rules. Let's follow the rules, because when you don't follow the rules, that's when corruption comes in, and that's when appearances of a corruption corruption won't come in with me council, we got to stay on you. point council of course yes and of course not with you no because no i way. totally respect you but my role as a good government politician means that i can't base my judgments on if i like a person or not no i really can't that isn't what america was built on deciding this guy's a good guy this guy isn't a good guy because i know you're a good guy and that isn't the point i, yes. I respect you i think you're doing a wonderful job and i appreciate you coming here this evening Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Denapoli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Chief. I don't, I, I, you I can, can. Chief, you can call me Dennis anytime. <laughs> uh, Mr. Nizzarella, I have a question. Where Chief Hayden was appointed twice as interim police chief, is that a new contract Could because he gets sworn in the second time, the third time, the fourth time? Technically, legally, is, is it a new contract? We're, we're or it's, our, it's under the terms of the same template, the same contract. That was, there are no new terms. Correct. So it's, it's just a continuation. Correct. It's not a new contract. Correct. Okay, that's, that's all I wanted you to answer. Thank you. And Chief, yes, sir. get the bad guys off my street. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council, is there any other questions for the Chief or for Mr. Attorney Nazarella? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I have one question. Chase, uh, Council Stewart. <laughs> uh, this is for the uh, city solicitor, actually. Uh, so what happens, and again, I'm supportive of the, um, Chief Hayden and have been in support. I do have a question about this part-time status as it relates to liability to the city. So, um, so when you're, uh, maybe I just need your, your legal um, sort of def explanation for this so I can understand it. So when you're full-time as a police chief, you go home, you're technically off the clock, I guess, but you're still, if something happens, you're still the police chief as a full-time staff, full-time employee, correct? If you're part-time and you go home and something happens, or, or you're on your way home, from the police station and there's an incident, there's a robbery and you, you are forced to intervene. I mean, I'm, not, I'm just not understanding what this part-time status does in that sense in terms of the city's liability. Well, I think what the, and I can't speak for Chief Hayden, but I, I think what he indicated earlier where this job is an intense job for him 
it's not that he, he stops thinking about it or responding to the call from the men and, woman, men and women of the police department after a certain hour. He's always in communication with them and always ready to react either by physically being there, offering the mentoring, cons uh, consulting, or any other means and avenues to get a particular job done. My question was around uh, a particular, it, 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 my question was actually around an in, the possibility of, of an incident happening. So the chief has signed off the clock for a particular day, and because he's no longer, he's not full time, so I'm assuming when he does leave the police station to go home, and he finds himself in a situation where there's a shootout and he gets involved right. and he's injured. What does that mean? It means that he would respond to that particular event as he would if he were at the station. The 960 hours are not defined by, uh, uh, as, as the set terms, they're flexible hours. He could um, pump up the hours on one particular week or day. He could decrease them on another day depending on the ebb and flow of the activity that's taking place and where he believes, based on his experience in uh, workings with the city, where he, he needs to spend that particular time. So you're saying on a particular day when he has, quote unquote, signed out for that day, he can at any moment sign back in? Yes. As long as he hasn't expended those hours? Correct. And that's at his discretion? Correct. And that legally, under that kind of construct, the city is protected? Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Council. Council Dubois. I have one final question for the chief, and then you can go home, if you don't mind. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Are you reporting all the hours you work? Yes. Thank you very much. Have a great night, and thank you for You're your welcome. service to the city. I'm officially off the clock now. You are. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Attorney Nezarell, I had a question for you. Isn't the standard under municipal employment that a full-time employee is 35 hours? That's the standard in Massachusetts, correct? That's correct. Okay, so the 960 hours, he, he could be deemed a full-time employee until he gets to that 960. Until he gets to that 960. 960 is the maximum amount that, that the guy can work. And when he gets to that 960, he's so all done. So even if it's a year contract, if he gets that 960 in nine months, that's it. That's correct. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I motion to uh, recommend favorably. Are you continuing this like you said, or are you going to make oh, a motion? Oh, thanks for the reminder. I'm continuing it. Is there a second on that? That's in the form of a motion? I would like to motion to Is there a second this. on the continuance? There is not. Okay. Well. You know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll second it for voting purposes. I appreciate that. And on the motion, um, the purpose of continuing this is so we can get a, the two legal opinions that we asked the city solicitor for. I think that we all have a responsibility to make sure that everything is ship shape. And in some ways, I feel like we shirked that responsibility when the building commissioner fiasco happened and with the water problem. So I'm asking that my fellow counselors just give the deference to waiting till we get a legal opinion on um, the different issues that we brought to the city solicitor. Counselor, just for clarification, when you've mentioned it a few times the building commission, you're not talking about the current building commissioner, no, correct? The correct. One that was a, pr a prior arrested. one that was incarcerated, no. correct. Okay. Mr. President, on, on the motion, if we can just get some clarification on what these two legal issues are, just for purposes of voting. Okay, so first off, um, who is responsible for taking the reports of um, of, of the police chief, of the, of the employee, who is um, is Mr. Nessarella still here? Yes, they're in the hallway. Okay. So the first is to find out who the running, person he's is. He's running down the hall. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. He'll remember exactly which uh, legal opinions I'm asking for. So the first is, what is the, um, who is the responsible person? Are the hours being reported to the right person? Because right now we have the employee's assistant getting the hours. When state law, in my reading, and in the reading of the retirement attorney, says that th those hours should be reported to the treasurer or the person that the city has deemed responsible for those hours. So there's legal responsibility that we're talking about here that I think that has been brought to light and we should get um, an opinion from our city solicitor on what that is and if there are things that aren't being followed that should be followed, then the, the city should change its its uh, policies and make sure that they're following the law. And the second is what was the definition of a full-time employee, which True. Counselor um, at Large Sullivan assisted with, but I had already asked, so we might as well get a legal opinion of that. 
So those are the two legal opinions. The first I find much more important, and if it isn't postponed till then, I probably will refile and bring in a retirement attorney and maybe the retirement attorney from Boston so he or she can explain to us clearly who should be taking these hours so we know. Sometimes you have to bring in people from the outside. So if it does not get postponed, that's what I plan on doing. All right, let's move the vote. Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And through the chair, we have a former police chief in the count as a counselor now. Uh, how was that done uh, well, when, you were, uh, when you were the police chief? Might, of course. Of course. The chief aide makes out a form. The form is sent to the auditor and checked to make sure it's right. Then it's sent to the treasurer, and the chief is paid. And the hours are accounted for in the computer. It's, it's, not, it's not like he's delegating it down. He's delegating it to the person who's supposed to take those and report them. It's for a payroll reason. And then very easy to yank the numbers out. So we start tonight. You query the computer, right? My, my third grade teacher would be happy with one third of the year through, and the chief is still about uh, 38 hours under the maximum he could work with that one third if you were kind of doing it that way. So, I mean, he's, he's doing a good job on that end, along with other things. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Mr. Chair, uh, perhaps I, I need to ask the, the same question to the uh, personnel director, uh, Ms. Cruz. She, she's saying no. Thank you, Ms. Cruz. Uh, no. How are the hours reported to, as to when they get to the auditor's office for payment? How are they done in the other departments in City Hall? The same way. It's, it's um, submitted by the, empl the employee. Uh, their time is, is re recorded by each department. It's submitted to the auditor's office for payroll purposes. It's entered in the computer system, and then we can, we can view it for, from um, the auditor's office and the personnel department. In your honest opinion, do you, feel, do you feel comfortable as to how these hours are being reported by the police chief? Yes. No, nothing further, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Let's move the question. Motion was made, and I, and I second it relative to a continuous of postponement until when, Counselor? Next, FinCom? Yes, please. Next, FinCom. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, raise your hand. Motion fails. Entertain a motion. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Motion made, properly seconded, favorable recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. Madam Clerk, we're going to go back to number two, please. Order appropriation of two million. $70,000 from the Stabilization Fund to the Police Department Personal Services, I'm sorry, Stabilization Fund, $1,120,000 to the Police Department Personal Services, $1,120,000 in order to finance the proposed cost, including all overtime costs of the contract settlement with the Brockton Police Association covering fiscal year 11, 12, and 13. From the Stabilization Fund, $950,000 to the Police Department Personal Services other than overtime, $890,000 in the police department overtime 60,000 in order to fund the proposed fiscal year 14 costs of a separate contract settlement with the same union for the period of fiscal year 14, 15 and 16. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Philip Nazarella, City Solicitor, Marion Cruz, Personnel Director, Robert Hayden, Interim Police Chief, Bill Healy, President, Police Patrolman Union. Mr. Mayor, good evening. Thank you. Um, let me just give you kind of an overview of, of my perspective of, of how we arrived at this uh, collective bargaining agreement and then certainly uh, there are folks here that were on the negotiating team that are available to answer questions. Um, I, I think there's, first of all, for folks um, that may be watching at home, uh, back on April 18th, I did send all the counselors a very detailed three and a half page recap of all the important provisions of the two three-year agreements uh, that were settled on. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll avoid going through the minutia because I think the councils have all had that information for two or three weeks now. Um, from the big picture, I think it's important to note that um, these are negotiations that were well underway long before I came on the job. There was an original negotiated agreement that was rejected by the patrolman's union overwhelmingly. 
Uh, there was work on a second potential agreement that was never completed during the last administration. And then I came in as the new administration, and basically it was the third time around now, but with a lot of work having already been done before I got here. Um, and so uh, that's where we came to the point of arriving at these two three-year agreements. Um, I think it's also important to realize from my perspective at looking at this, that I felt as I reviewed all of this and I was briefed on it, that I don't feel there was a real wide range to negotiate within because I think that the contract that the firefighters were awarded last summer really kind of set the parameters. And I don't think you have to look any further than what's occurred in the city of Boston uh, when, the, um, when the police patrolmen there were unable to get a contract comparable to the firefighters. They went to arbitration, received a huge award. Um, so I think it was important to try to get an agreement, to get the most favorable agreement we could possibly get um, for the city and to also take care of our police officers. And I think also there was a little bit of a sense of urgency to try to get this one done because we've got half a dozen other unions that have already begun negotiations on new agreements. And I want to bargain in good faith with all of these folks too. But the reality is I've got police officers that are almost four years without a raise now while all the other city unions are only six months out of contract. And I say only, but in comparison to being almost four years out of contract. So I think it was important to get this one done. I think it was important to get it um, the most favorable contract that we could. Uh, and I do think that the union in the earlier negotiations before I arrived had rejected a previous agreement overwhelmingly and it indicated in negotiations they were very willing to go to arbitration uh, where they felt they would do much better than the doing in negotiations. So I think there had to be some good faith on both sides. I think there was. Um, and in terms of um, you know where we came to on the agreement, I think that we got this thing settled. I expressed to all the counselors in the letter that I sent out that if you want to say we're under some financial duress, we've got a very difficult budget coming up, we don't have the money, you know, we're taking a hit financially, sure. I, I'm not going to disagree with any of that. I think that is our situation. But I think that after um, numerous sessions with our bargaining team, after listening to the city's attorneys and the city's negotiators, uh, it was clear to me that the financial risk and potential harm to the city financially by not getting a deal done and by allowing this to go to arbitration was even far greater than with what we're faced with here. So um, as I expressed in the letter, I uh, do ask you for your favorable recommendation uh, on this contract. I do think it's a fair and equitable settlement. I do feel both sides bargained in good faith. And I do feel that um, in light of the contract that the firefighters received uh, last summer, that you know, there's, there's a pretty narrow room of where we had to negotiate within. And we made a good, uh, we made a, a good faith effort to address some of the issues of parity. I think there was goodwill on the part of the union that they indicated a willingness to um, address this parity issue over the course of several contracts and not necessarily expect us to get the police caught up to the fire in, in one day. Um, and at the end of the day, I think that the recommendation, I'll allow the CFO to speak for himself, but the recommendation from the CFO is the exact same recommendation that was in front of this council with the firefighters contract last summer, and that is that he's able to certify the funds for the first year of the upcoming three-year deal and is not presently able to certify the funds for years two and three, and that's exactly the same basis that we approved the, uh, the agreement with the firefighters under. So having said that, um, I'll turn the phone, uh, microphone over to uh, the CFO, Mr. Condon, and any of the other folks who were invited in that you would like to ask questions of, you know, we're here to openly discuss uh, the negotiations and the agreement. Mr. Condon, good evening. Uh, good evening, counselors. I think the mayor has fairly described uh, 
the structure of the contract and how we came to, to the resolution of the contract. Um, with respect to the firefighters deal on which it was patterned, it's, it's important to reference that because it was patterned on the firefighters deal. Um, if you take the city's constrained finances out of the picture, I think the firefighters deal was a pretty cheap deal because it came in at less than 2% a year over the, over the six years. Most times, especially with a large public safety union, we would happily take that deal. Our problem is that we've been cut in state aid. They've restored some of it, but it's not nearly what was reduced. And because of that, and we've got other costs that are going up at the same time, we just have a hard time maintaining the services that we want to maintain within the current revenue structure. But if you look at the firefighters contract on its own merits, it was a fair deal. It was hard bargained. It took us a long time to get to that deal with the firefighters. It wasn't there wasn't a cheaper deal available with the firefighters without going to arbitration with that union as well because they weren't willing, and I can understand from their perspective why, to settle for a contract which didn't have an, a retroactive element to it, and they were already out of the deal for three years themselves. So the police contract is patterned on that same deal. It's the same basic settlement pattern for all of these years, 11, 12, 13, and then 14, 15, 16. The difference is, by the time we got back to the police uh, negotiations again uh, last fall after the firefighters contract was funded, uh, the word was out that there was going to be a good sized arbitration award for the Boston patrolman, came to 25%. So the simple firefighter deal was no longer going to be sufficient. We have had discussions with both the patrolman's union and with the uh, supervisor's union over several contract cycles which discussed from their perspective, how firefighters were more highly compensated than police officers. I'm sure the fire union would have a different point of view as to how you properly measure that. Uh, there's a difference in that discussion when it went down in Boston as well. But nonetheless, in, if you look at the budget books, you'll see that there is a difference and there are several pay elements that con uh, contribute <coughs> to that. So to come to a resolution this time, and knowing that we had a critical safe public safety union, which, as we discussed tonight, puts its lives on the line every day. Now, they're not getting shot every day, but every day they are subject to having hostile action taken against them, and they're putting their lives on the line. Already four years and counting without a contract. To simply say, we won't deal with this issue when it was very, very important to them, was not going to get a settlement. If you go to arbitration, the mere process that that uh, begins is disruptive. It's expensive. We have to hire outside attorneys for that. It's expensive on city time. I'm involved. Maureen Cruz is involved. The chief of police is involved. Um, it is disruptive to harmonious working relationships, and that is very important with this kind of a union. And at the end of the day, um, the process generally results in a deal which is better for the union than they would have got if we simply come to a fair deal at the table. So my view is this is expensive. It's hard to swallow. If we had a few more million dollars in revenue, if the state simply magically came back with eight million bucks, you'd have a full certification from me. Uh, the reason for the conditional certification is I think if we do a couple of things. I don't need to beat up everybody on that. We all know where I'm coming down on the, on the use of the levy and the use of the water rate increase. If we had those revenues, this contract could be certified. But without them, I don't know where we are. It's all, it's all suspect that we're going to get it. I can't give that second and third year certification. Nonetheless, I recommend it because if we don't do this, I think at the end of the day, we will pay more in the end than we will by getting this funded, and we'll have a very, very disruptive working relationship with a critical workforce, and that's, uh, that's my little speech. I'm just probably taking questions. Thank you, Mr. Condon. Uh, Council Cruz. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Condon. Um, currently, the stabilization fund, what do we have in it? Uh, when this contract came in for funding, it was a little bit over $4.5 million. And so if you approve this, you'll take, what's that, $2 million and 70000 from that, leaving a balance on the, of a little over two and, what's that, $2,400,000 2, roughly at that point. Okay. If you, and we if still you don't it. know where we're going to end up on, we've deficit spent, spent the snow. We still uh, that's going to, the, the deficit to be raised in the fiscal 16, I'm sorry, fiscal 15 budget uh, is going to be about a million dollars. It's about 900,000 on the snow side, and I think there are some court cases that are pending that will get settled out that probably exhaust the appropriation that is in the budget for the law department. So about a million dollars. 
out of the two million that's left? Well, no, Mike, uh, I, I haven't finished with, with the mayor. I don't know how he'll recommend structuring the budget, but my recommendation would be to leave that an, intact and fund in, the deficit out of the revenues of the city. Into next year's budget? Next year's budget, okay, yes. Okay, so, so we should have about two million left in the uh, Yeah, we're at the, we're, at the fund. We're, we're pretty much done with the, with the supervisor's contract, so that would tap into that, but you'd still have about two million left, yes, if you approve both of these contracts, yeah. Okay. And then just, uh, we all have your letter, but the public doesn't. You, you have certified this through the first year. Yes, because it's coming from reserves, that's right. But you won't certify beyond that unless the city is willing to levy property taxes to incorporate the full 2.5%? Yes, that's worth about $3 million. And do something about the, uh, the water rates. Yes, and the reason for that, Councillor, is that um, in the present budget, the fiscal 14 budget. Uh, for years, we've had enterprise funds which were self-sufficient, the water, sewer, and trash were self-sufficient. There are costs that are paid by the general fund on their behalf. Mainly it's health insurance, but there are other costs as well, property insurance. In the fiscal 14 budget, the water department for the first time in, I don't know, 20 years, didn't have a sufficient revenue structure to pay for capital or to reimburse the general fund fully for the, the amount that was owed to the general fund. They ended up paying the general fund, I think, about 600000 out of a $2.2 .2 million bill. So that is owed. If you raise the water rates sufficient to pay that back bill, pay the cost on an ongoing basis, and reinstitute a capital program, I you know you had some folks in front of you the other night talking about the problems they have with water pressure. You know, we have an old system. We can't not spend capital money on it. At some point, we've got to start that again, and it doesn't do us any good to delay that. I think 20 to 25 percent, you know, it's a question of how you structure it, when you implement it. But if you had that water rate increase, at least to pay back the general fund for what was owed, the amount last year plus the amount for the next year, it's another three million bucks. So there's six million dollars between those two sources. That's what I'm saying. If they were present, I could certify this unconditionally, uh, but they aren't present yet. I don't know whether the mayor will or will not recommend, or if he did, whether the council would fully appropriate the levy, and I don't know whether the council would take action on the water rate, so that's the reason for the unconditional. And if we didn't take those two actions and we approve the contract, do you think you'd see the need for layoffs? Yes. And those layoffs, probably because of COPS grants, wouldn't come out of the police department, correct? I mean, and I'm not saying where I want them to come, but they wouldn't come out of the police department, and because of net school spending, they probably wouldn't come out of the school department, correct? Well, I think um, if, I'll take the school department first. Notwithstanding, even if we fully fund the school department next year, I think they're facing a difficult budget because they've seen the loss of grant funds. So just this, this afternoon when I was at a luncheon that the superintendent hosted, where I'm going with that is I think there are probably gonna be layoffs in the school department next year. Regardless of, regardless. What we, yeah, regardless of what we do, because they've lost so much in terms of grant funding, Title I funding, which comes from the federal government, that's worth $2 million a year that has disappeared on them, but those students haven't gone anywhere. Those are poorer students. They're entitled to services. In addition to that, we've basically added two new schools worth of students in the last few years two new schools worth of students. We had a 15,000 school system that we built five new schools for. We've now got 17,500 students. It's at least two schools. So they have problems in managing their budget with what we're probably able to give them, regardless of whether we have a levy increase or not. And if we don't, and we have to go to the rest of the budget, the work I've done so far that I've got to discuss with the mayor shows a deficit. How we address that will be his call, but I don't <coughs> suspect that you'll be seeing police department layoffs because those grant programs, I mean, if you have layoffs, I think there are probably avenues for wa uh, waivers, but I don't believe that, from what I've heard, there's a lot of sentiment for reducing the police force in Brockton. I think the feeling is we haven't got enough police or fire. Where we find that money, I don't know. Without us, without those two sources of revenue. Yes, sir, that's right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor <clears throat> thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Condon. Good evening, Councilor. First off, I, I want to take time to thank you and all other people that uh, sat at the negotiating table to put this package together. And I know that, um, you know, having uh, negotiated with you over the years when uh, I was on the school committee with you, I know, I know how you work very diligently and, and work in the best interest of not only what the city is faced with, but what we have to be faced with for what the employees need as well. So Thank you. I, 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 think that's I commend you on that. And, and again, I commend everybody from both sides. I commend the mayor as well for, um, you know, new mayor for having to step into this um, 
situation where he has to, you know, adversely, you know, decide what's in the best interest of the police department. And I think the best interest of the department is to make sure that, you know, they have a contract to work with. Um, it's sad when they have to go three, four, five years without a contract while other people are, are getting uh, pay raises and, and they're not because of how a contract may, may work out. Um, in my eyes, of course, it's costly, no doubt about it. Uh, is the city still under financial constraints? Yes, it is. It still is and, and will continue to be. Are we going to be faced with a tight budget? Yeah, we are. There's no doubt about that as well. Um, but I'm not a negotiator, and, and, and I'm not going to sit here tonight and pull this apart because that's not my job is to negotiate, not my job to micromanage what's been done here. It's my job to feel comfortable to the fact that I'm appropriating this type of money to have what I feel is most important to the city of Brockton, and that's public safety officials, men and women on the street, to make sure that my neighborhood, my ward, and the entire city is kept safe. As far as I'm concerned, there's not enough money in the world that could pay me to be a firefighter <laughs> or a police officer, and I mean that, seriously. You know, we all go to work every day, and I go to work every day in, in hopes and anticipation I'm coming back to my home at night. Sometimes these men and women, both fire department and police officers, leave and they're not too sure what their day may bring. None of us know what our day may bring. There's no guarantee to any type of life. So as far as I'm concerned, for me to sit here and even go through this and pick it apart, not going to happen. I support it in its fullest. I understand what you're saying with your certification, Mr. Condon, and I respect that as well. That's something that we're going to have to deal with. But again, it's not the first time we've been in this position with contracts to deal with it on a year-to-year -year basis, and I think that's our job working with you and with the mayor to make sure that everything can work so that these people have, have the increase that they're well, well deserved. So with that being said, end of my discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Mr. Condon, uh, just so that I understand the facts correctly, so going to arbitration, Arbitration does not compel this body to vote in favor of whatever comes no, out of No, you're correct in that, correct? Councillor. If we go to arbitration and the, there's, a, there's a, an award granted by the panel, uh, the chief executive of the uh, city is obligated under the, the statute to advocate for it in front of the city council. City council is not obligated to fund it. The council can vote not to fund it, and it simply returns the parties to the table. Right. That's, that's, that was my understanding of the process, just to be clear. So secondly, with the, the firefighters uh, increase, which was a little over $3 million last year, yes. and we're talking about $2 million this year, uh, we're looking at $5 million of increases in salaries with no increase in service. Is that an accurate statement? Yes. Yes. Uh, and so that concerns me, that taxpayers are paying $5 million more, but we're not increasing the service base. I think that just should be acknowledged. Um, I, I do support this, and I support it because um, I think it's hard to argue that the police officers who serve the city, um, should, whose pay should not keep pace with uh, the highest paid um, uh, public employees, which are the firefighters. And I would say that was my principal concern and why I voted against the firefighters uh, contract last year, not because I didn't think they were deserving, but you have limited resources. Also knowing that the police would seek something similar, which they rightfully should, and how could you argue against that? And then that would place us in this situation again of trying to figure out how to pay for all of this. And I've, I've always had issue with contracts that go back retroactively two, three, five years for pay increases when we know that particularly in Brockton, most folks are not seeing pay increases and they're certainly not seeing increases that stretch back over multiple years. And so it just seems fundamentally or at least principally unfair um, that this is what the structure is. But um, again, that was my reason for not, not supporting the firefighters um, contract. Um, concerning the, the water rates and using that to supplement, so again, what you're recommending is a full levy of 2.5% plus bringing some level of increase in the water rates to cover, to be able to justify the spending. Um, so I just have concerns moving forward, particularly, and I, I say this thinking of the mayor's commitment not mm -hmm. to raise taxes. Yeah. I don't know how you do it all, but that's, you know, I guess that's up to your team to figure out how to make all of this right. balance. Um, but I would say that I would not be in support of raising uh, the water rates unless the administration has demonstrated some plan of how that department has been revamped. I know we're looking to have yep. some new leadership there, and so unless there's some plan articulated to me that shows that things are going to be operating differently, 
um, and that the taxpayers will be getting a better return on their investment. And from my point of view, I wouldn't support that. And so I think that's a case you guys I may. I understand that, Councilor. May, may, may I make a comment on that? My my advocacy there is to, is within the res the context of ensuring that the present level of services in the city are preserved. I mean, another choice is to say we don't want the additional money. You know, we're willing to find budget cuts to accommodate the level of revenue that we have to support the budget. That's that's an entirely different argument. You know, my, my, right, my advocacy has to do with maintenance of services. That's what I think is needed to maintain services. And I think that's key. And I think my uh, colleague, Councillor Cruz, um, made a very good point, which everyone should also understand, that if there are layoffs, they're likely not to come from these departments that have gotten these um, right. you know, significant pay increases. And so we're paying more for consistent service in fire and police because we're not adding on new individuals and the potential of diminishing services in other departments. So it just, it just concerns me, it should concern everyone. Um, but I, I will support this principally because I, I just cannot imagine paying our police officers uh, in a way that doesn't respect the work they're doing compared to um, some of the other city workers. So, well, th thank you, Mr. Condon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Denapoli. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Condon. Good evening, Councilor. Um, I've been here 16 years and uh, I have never voted against a contract that's been negotiated, and I, I, I will support this contract. But question for you, you want to, uh, to help pay for this contract, the money has to come from somewhere. And you, you have said in, in your letter that you want to raise the levy two and a half percent. In the 16 years that I've been sitting here, and also Council Ianeri can probably uh, help me on this. We've never raised a levy two and a half percent. No, yes, that's not correct, Councillor. Every year we've raised a levy two and a half percent. I believe there were two years in the 23 years I've been here where we left a portion of that levy unlevied. There was a time, I think, at the be beginning of, um, sorry, at the end of the units administration where about a million dollars was left on the table. Uh, so we raised the levy about 2%, not 25 And then two years ago, the same thing was done. About a million dollars was unlevied, but we, ra we raised 2%. Every year other than that, we're not talking about exceeding and going to the voters. We're talking about raising the levy by the 2.5% that the, that the law allows. Uh, and we've always done it except for two years. Well, we always raise it to like maybe 1.6, 1.7 on, the, on, the, on, the, on that levy. I'm talking about that. We've always raised the levy by the amount which equals two and a half percent. Which is the uh, max under the law. Max under the law. Right. Uh, the amount that that is worth has grown over the years as the levy itself has grown. So it's not that that amount of money is not worth about three million dollars. A few years ago, maybe 15 years ago, it might have been worth about a million six. Yeah. But we've always gone up except for two years. So if we, if, if we do raise it. The two and a half percent. Everybody's looking between a one and a two hundred dollar increase. Uh, well, the increase on the value of the home would depend upon would depend upon the every value house of the home. is different. That's yes. right, and I think the average increase would be more like about ninety bucks. But some people might see two or three hundred, and some people yes. might see five or it's six. I'll also say the mayor has not said to me that he's willing to approve a, a pro, a recommend appropriations that come to the full levy use. Mm -hmm. We haven't had that discussion. He's actually indicated to me he's not. I, mean, I don't know what his final decision will be. Uh, and the budget I've prepared for him includes an assumption that this contract is funded. If it isn't, I'll back that out. But I'm presuming that based on what happened with the fire contract last year, that this contract will be funded. And the budget I've prepared for him has that money in the police budget, and it has a deficit that we have to figure out how to close. Now, we only have the month of May and month of June. Do we have any other negotiating contracts that are? We're at, we're at the table with every union, with the exception of the Police Supervisors Union, which has uh, agreed at the table and will be bringing a contract or a funding request to you uh, tomorrow. That's that'll be at the next city council. Yes, I sir. just received That's that right. today. But the rest of them are all of the other city unions, uh, the laborers, the water and sewer workers, the clerks, and two or three other unions are all the library union. They're all, they're all at the table. So that could happen before June, too, correct? Um, I don't think so. No? I don't think so. Well, I think we hope too, not, anyway. I think there's too much work to be done to be able to get that done before yeah, Absolutely. Right now, we probably can't afford any more of this. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Carter. Thank you. Thank Mr. you, Council. Council Bonds. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Condon. Uh, I, I understand that our, may, our position or our job is not to um, go over the negotiation process, but I just want to be clear in myself. No. 
The mayor referenced several times um, that this contract was parroted of the firefighter's contract. And if I remember correctly, um, sitting over there, when the firefighter contract came up, um, when Councilor Azak and I were listening, um, there were several references to the teacher contract and how you know it's mm -hmm. not this, it's not that, and everything is kind of going back to a previous contract in reference to how it's not quite that. So my question is, um, just how much negotiation goes on if all of the contracts that come subsequent to some other contract it looks like that or, or is, is based upon that or reference that? Well, quite a bit. I mean, for example, in the case of the teacher's contract, the public safety unions are well aware of what the percentage increases and how those were structured over time, what they were granted uh, in, in contracts which preceded theirs. So if we make a proposal, for example, we're willing to give you 2% a year for three years, and the teachers have received 3% a year for each of those years, uh, their uh, opposition to that will be, why us different from that group? And so then there's a lot of discussion as to, well, can we afford or not afford, and how do we structure it maybe that, you know, we can get to agreement on this and maybe not pay you as much. And there are also language items that they're looking for, and how you put the money to the various pay elements takes a lot of time. So uh, some, some negotiations are pretty quick, okay. others are much more lengthy. Okay, all right, I just wanted to get that clear. And, and actually, uh, one other thing. Um, when, when, how much exactly was the firefighter? I'm sorry? How much exactly was the, the I think final the, contract? I uh, think the firefighter contract, for, for, uh, for, which was for three years that had passed and this fiscal year was right. for about three and a half million dollars. That's my recollection, 3.5 something. Okay, now, the firefighters have a larger uh, work base because there's only one union representing the whole department except for the clerks. The police are split into two. Right, and actually that leads into my next question. So at the end of all this, will the law enforcement as a department, will that amount of money going to them look or look like what's going to the fire, firefighters now? Will it be virtually the same amount of money in the end? By the end of the contract? Of everybody, the supervisors, all of that. Yes, when you, okay. when you, by the end of this contract, which will take us out through fiscal 16, mm -hmm. the amount of money on a dollar basis which is paid to comparable ranks for police officers will more closely approach the amount of money that's paid to uh, firefighters, but it won't quite get there. Okay, and that's including the supervisors that are coming up, right? Yes, the same, okay. the same basic structure will be for them, too. Okay, thank you. Okay. Also, Council, Almost said thank Council you. Dubois. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Condon, my question is for the mayor. I'm sorry? My question is for the mayor. Oh, then I'll step aside. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Um, mayor Carpenter, how was Haiti? I mean, how was uh, the um, Dominican Republic? Where did you go? Cape Verde. Cape Verde. Tell me. So how was Cape I'm just Verde? glad you were concerned about me. Yeah, yeah. how was it? <clears throat> it was great. Wonderful. Well, welcome back to the United States. We'd love to have you here. Thank you. So I'm a good government person, and I believe in good government, and I believe in that vein, I think government has a role to play in improving people's lives. So for me, taxes are more about making sure people's money isn't spent on fraudulent or wasteful, um, in a wasteful manner. So I'm, I think that we should watch taxes, but I'm not an enemy of taxes. I'm a Democrat, I believe that government has a role to play and we have to pay for the services we get from our public, um, public uh, officials and, and police and fire are <laughs> extremely important. And that's my political platform and that's how I believe deep inside myself, I think government has a huge role to play in making people's lives better. However, you ran on a platform that, if I remember, kind of disparaged the council for raising taxes and said that you weren't going to raise taxes. So can you tell me, how are you supporting this contract when your CFO, who has a, um, a degree from, where's your degree from, Mr. Condon? Help me. Wharton School of Wharton. Finance. Wharton School of Finance, pretty good school. He's been here a long time. How are you going to, to do this without raising taxes and going back on a campaign promise? What are you going to do? Well, I guess we're going to figure that out over the next uh, four or five weeks uh, before we bring you the, the new budget. 
Uh, I think what I tried to outline to you in, in the letter that I sent out a couple of weeks ago is <clears throat> very clear that uh, I don't for a minute uh, deny the fact that we've got some tough financial circumstances uh, in terms of the upcoming budget. But at the end of the day, I think that the I think that we got the best deal that we could get, and at the same token, um, the financial risk to the city is far greater to allow this to go to arbitration between the cost of the arbitration and what a potential award would probably look like based upon the very recent history of an almost identical scenario in Boston, um, that they're all tough decisions to make that this is the better decision for the financial security of the city. There's no doubt it's going to be a tough budget. There are going to be tough decisions to make. And over the next uh, 25 or 30 days, Mr. Kahn and I are going to be spending a lot of time together. And uh, I'm going to bring you the most responsible budget that I possibly can. So you're here tonight with this contract that um, the city CFO won't certify beyond um, four months from what? Two months from now. Beyond the current year. Yeah. Be not the fiscal year, which ends June 30th. So beyond, what is it, June, two months, he can't certify this contract. Um, so I would think as the chief executive of the city, you've given some thought on how you're going to close that that huge gap that you're facing. Oh, so, I, I like, think we're, where we're, will the layoffs be coming from if you're not going to um, raise taxes? I think we're giving that a lot of thought on a daily basis. The target's still moving a little bit. We don't have a final budget from the state level yet. And uh, I think that we'll have you know, plenty of time to discuss that when we bring the budget forward. But I don't think that changes what the situation is today in terms of reaching a collective bargaining agreement with the patrolman's union. I have two questions, if you wouldn't mind just staying right there. Mr. Condon, could you just come up for a second and help me refresh my memory? If you'll just stay right there, Mayor, I wouldn't want to make you come up and down. Okay, Mr. Condon, what's the date that we have to have the budget by deadline state mandated? Uh, well, I didn't look at that before I came. I think it's, it's something like 170 date. days from the organization of state government is what I think is the date. And you right. had January 7th, was that inaugural day? That's so right. 170 days from that. We're well within the window on that. We'll have it to you. I'm hoping to have it to you, finish my work with the mayor uh, in the next week or two, and then have it to you well before Memorial Day, which is what we normally do. So 170 days. That's the outside limit to get it to you from January 7th. So help me figure that out. So 170 days divided by 30 is 6. No, it's 170 calendar days from, when from you the get sworn organization in the of the government. And you got sworn in on what day? We got sworn so on the 7th. January, January. Six, January 6th, January 6th. So then 170 days. I think that's the number. I, I'm not sure. I haven't, I didn't look before tonight, but I think it's 170 days. I believe days. it is. Well, that's not going to take me much time. If you just give me one second. I'm just trying to figure something out here. 30 days half September, April, June, and November. So it's five, February, <laughs> March, April, May, June. So sometime in June, right? I think that'd be the deadline, early June, but we won't be that Early late. June. We and the, when, does, when does the fiscal year start? Jan July 1st. Yeah, so if you have until early June, or maybe a little bit later, and the fiscal year starts on uh, July 1, right. and we have to have time to review the budget right. and have budget um, hearings, which right. usually take around a week. That means that the best, we're going to have two weeks to review the budget, if we're lucky, and that's if the chairman, the, the city council president, pushes the hearings out as late as possible. Which I won't be doing that, Councilor. Exactly. I'll state it right now. I'm not doing that. I'll All do right. what I did in 2008. We're going to do it earlier. Yeah. So my issue is if we're going to have a budget with potential layoffs and huge cuts to departments, I'm making the public request that we get that budget before when the state mandates that you have Office to give it to us. committed council that I would do everything I can to have it to you because, at least two weeks before that. Because the last few years it's been really pushed out and I, I believe that we will be requesting a public hearing again this year. So I just want to have that courtesy because I think I can speak for myself where I council, work I think, I think the CFO I think I've made the commitment and I also would to, say it's been, never been in June. As long as I have been CFO, the budget has never been submitted to the city council in June, That's and it correct. won't be this time. Fine. Thank you. Gotcha. Do you have a qu any further questions? I don't. 
Thomas, does anybody else have any questions on this? I just want to make a statement because there was some confusion um, relative to the MOA memorandum of agreement that was signed. Uh, people asked me as the president of the council if I participated in collective bargaining negotiations with a legislative branch. Of course, I did not do that. The administrative staff did. They did it well, and I support it. Um, but my name is signed here on the document as acting mayor, and why that is uh, for those watching on TV and those in attendance is that uh, the mayor has a, a blood relative that works for the department, so there was a potential conflict of interest. Uh, under the charter and a letter from the solicitor's office indicates as such that the president of the council under the charter is the acting mayor. So for purposes of executing this document, my administrative function was to sign this as the acting mayor. So there were some questions on why I was on this. I did not participate, but I do support it. We have to protect the men and women that protect us every day. Any uh, entertain a motion? Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Properly second. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Mr. President, I'd like to ask if we could uh, take number 11 out of order, please. Council Bonds, there's a motion made to take number 11 out of order. Second? Second. Second made. All in favor of taking out of order. These people have been patient. It's not going to take that long. All in favor of taking out order, raise your hand, please. All opposed. Uh, Madam Clerk, number 11, please. Resolve. Be it resolved that Brockton's first ever Bike to Work Day will be held during the third week of May, May 16th, which is also National Bike Bicycle Week. May 10th to the 18th. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John Lenhart, Mass and Motion Community Planner, Paul Chenard, Paul Chenard Old Colony Planning Council. Council. Yes, thank Council, you. Council, you don't have to stand. Oh, okay. If you want to, you can. You're looking good tonight, oh, so if you want to, go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you uh, so much, uh, Mr. President. I just wanted to uh, let everyone know uh, biking and, and uh, health and nutrition are things that are very important to me. And I had several <laughs> meetings uh, with Paul Chenard from OCPC and with uh, ja Jana, Jana, Jana Lin uh, Linhart um, from the mayor's office. And um, Paul is actually working on getting some stationary bike uh, parking areas for the city so to encourage biking, to encourage uh, saving our environment, to encourage reducing our carbon footprint. And uh, there is a National Bike Week uh, that's coming up it's next week. And there's going to be a coordinated <coughs> effort that he's planning uh, for folks in the area to bike to work. And, and actually, if Paul could come up and just speak a little bit more about that. Good evening, sir. Thanks for being so patient. It's a long one tonight. Thank you for being here. No uh, I appreciate being um, welcome to the council meeting. Um, and I would like to thank um, Councillor Barnes for um, helping me appear here tonight and for the great work Donna Linhart has been doing um, as part of the, um, the mayor's office to um, get this first ever uh, bike week started here in Brockton. Um, as you all know, uh, the Commonwealth holds um, an annual bike, um, Bay State Bike Week as it's called, and the nation as a whole also holds uh, bike week as well, and May is considered bike month. And what we just hope to achieve is to promote cycling as an alternative mode of transportation within Brockton and to also reward those who um, currently do so, as you can see um, when you go over to the BAT uh, Intermodal Center and also to um, the T commuter rail station, that people do actually bike to um, these modes of transportation to head into the city or wherever else they may um, go to work. That said, uh, we invite everyone on the council and those in the public to please um, come out and support Bike to Work Day. It's going to be May 16th. It's going to be in front of the Bat Intermodal Center. Um, there's going to be a couple of different organizations there. Um, obviously, OCPC, the mayor's office, also the YMCA. And we're going to have a bunch of different tables out there uh, providing literature on biking to work, um, also safety and cycling within the city, and also to talk about um, OCPCs in the city of Brockton's um, new to come um, bicycle parking locations. So there's going to be bike racks throughout the city, which um, the city has been uh, diligent about getting its application in to get these bike racks that are at no cost to the city. So thank and you again. If, if I could just say too, um, Travis Cycle right on uh, North Main Street, they have all of your biking needs. I, I got uh, my bike uh, refurbished there. I got a helmet there. I actually, I, last season, I was actually riding my bike pretty frequently around, around the city and people, you know, they saw me riding my bike with my helmet and my backpack, but um, it's definitely a way to, to keep in shape. It's a way to, to engage with folks um, and again, to uh, save the environment. So I would encourage everyone, I'm gonna do it. I would encourage everyone to, to do that, but I'll yield to. My fellow council. And if you're Thank looking you. on um, Belmont in the morning, you usually see me biking to work. So 
no, say hi. Let me see. <laughs> I encourage people to join as well. You don't get on West Elm because there's too many. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's not, it's not the most direct route <laughs> for me, but, you know. Black like on that one. Wear your helmet. Uh, thank you, Councilor, for bringing this to us. Uh, Councilor Dubois. Yes, I want to thank the councilor for bringing this to us. I bike all the time. It's my favorite thing to do, and I'll be there. I'm really glad that you're having this activity in the city. It will be there. I uh, just got a new bike just two weeks ago. I'm so excited about it. I gave my last one away to one of the people in the neighborhood because I like the old-fashioned bikes. And so um, I'm excited to be there with you, and I appreciate you doing it. And I've had a lot of requests from parents of Brookfield school students for a bike ride up there and I remember when I was a kid I would bike ride to Franklin School and uh, Councillor Cruz's father would allow me to store my bicycle in his office and that was really kind of him and so I encourage everybody to get out there and bike. Thank, Thank you. you Council. Council, is anybody else? Move for a favorable work in the Second. Council Bond, do you want to make it since your motion? Oh, um, <laughs> okay. Uh, I move for a f <laughs> favorable Recommendation. Recommendation to the full council. <laughs> Motion was made properly. Second, favor recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed. Motion carries. Thank you again. Thank you for being Thank here. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilor. I have a bunch of residents here, and it seems to be the last one on the agenda with residents. And so I would like to take resolve number eight out of order. Second. Thank you. Motion made properly. Second to take agenda item number eight out of order. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed. That motion carries. Madam Clerk, number eight, please. Resolved that the Bay State Animal Cooperative and a representative of the Brockton Animal Control be invited to appear before May 5th Finance Committee to discuss the epidemic of stray and homeless cats in Brockton, the effects on the citizens and animals, and how we might be able to better tackle this problem as a community. Invited Thomas Chichilla, Supervisor of Animal Control, and Marsha Mata, President of BSAC. Mr. President. Councilor. I filed, um, Ms. Mata, if you wouldn't mind coming up, I, and, and your awesome team of volunteers. Um, I filed this resolve uh, because as a resident, um, I have live on Bank Street, and we have a feral cat community on Bank Street. And I noticed that um, there were a whole bunch of pretty sickly looking cats on my street two summers ago, and I am not a proponent of killing cats because they just, other stray car, cats come and replace them. So the goal is to do a spay neuter release program. And I was lucky enough to um, get in a hold of a woman named Nicolina who does this on her spare time, and we were able to trap, neuter, and release over 35 feral cats in that one summer, and we literally adopted out 36 kittens that one summer. Um, and we were able to do that, and only through the kindness of this individual was I able to do it. But through that, I got to know the broader cat community, um, which is in a lot of ways led by Ms. Mata, who's right here, and her team, who do similar work, only even more expanded than the work that um, I did in my little neighborhood. So Ms. Mata asked for me to have her come and talk about the cat issue with all of us and those at home, maybe give them an idea of how they can help. Um, so that's why I filed this. Thank you, Councillor. Good evening, Ms. Mata. Good evening. Thank you for having me, Councillors. Um, uh, like Councillor um, Dubois mentioned, um, Nicolina is one of the people who is a volunteer under our group and under um, many, one of many individuals that do this type of work in the community. We're all volunteer. Um, what we're here for is um, I've been actively involved for nine years here in Brockton. I started the Brockton Cat Coalition in 2005, which at the time was not a nonprofit. It was basically a group of individuals that was practicing trap, neuter, return for the feral community cats which we call them community cats, because when they're feral and they're in the wild, whether they're stray or homeless, they're community cats. They're the responsibility of us as a community. Um, there, after we um, expanded and decided to open a umbrella group called the Bay State Animal Cooperative in 2009, um, so Bay, uh, Brockton Cat Coalition is, is an active trap, neuter, return group under that. As the Bay State Animal Cooperative, we do a lot more than just trap, neuter, return. We work with surrendered, rescued, injured um, animals, and we work um, with a variety of other groups and individuals. Um, we have a map here in front of me that basically is what we've been using as a, kind of a visual of what's been going on with primarily what we call the colonies. Um, however, colonies are not always um, feral cats. Um, we've 
as one individual group, we have done over a thousand cats, um, spayed and neutered, released, adopted. Um, however, there are several thousand more out there. Um, we have what we would say about 115 colonies, and colonies are groups of cats within people's backyards, businesses. There's a lot of them here. This is just a small selection because there are many other people working as individuals throughout the community doing the same thing. What we're trying to talk to um, counselors um, about is the fact that this is, this is a serious issue. I know some people may look at cats and say it's an animal or, or it's not that big of a, um, um, a deal in the big picture. It is. It's a serious, serious issue. And personally, I'm sick of the roller coaster that I've been on for over 30 years of my life. The roller coaster of let's spay, let's neuter, let's spay, let's neuter, let's adopt, let's spay, let's neuter, let's adopt. If you don't actively, aggressively address this issue in these large cities like Brockton, this problem will never go away. I'll die still on the same roller coaster, and that's not my goal. My goal is to change it, and I think it's important for all of us to understand this is a serious problem. With this problem cause, comes many other issues. Unvaccinated animals, um, compromised individuals, and when I say that, I'm talking about the elderly, the mentally ill, the young, vulnerable people who become hoarders because what they don't want to do is kill any animal. It becomes a serious issue amongst um, people that, that do that. Um, people who can't afford spay and neuter, all of a sudden their one or two cats in their home become 15 cats, 20 cats, and now they're in a prob they're in a this bad situation. Um, irresponsible feeding. A lot of people just want to stop this. We've dealt with this in a lot of some of the um, buildings here in Brockton in the past where we've been told just no, people have to stop feeding. That does not solve the problem. You are not going to stop my grandma, your grandma, Auntie Ann from feeding a cat if they want to feed it. I don't care what you threaten them, threaten their life, okay? It's not going to happen. So that's not the easy way to just say stop feeding. The answer is let's be responsible feeders and that's what we want to develop. Um, Abuse. Um, I will give one particular case, but we all know as, as um, human beings that abuse comes, um, human abuse a lot of times starts with animal abuse. And I know of a particular case that we dealt with that has come to fruition that um, individuals who were shooting BBs at three particular kittens that we had to remove from the area for that only, that main reason was they were being abused, have later been now um, arrested for, for murder. So it doesn't fall far from the abuse of animals and the abuse of humans. So it's a serious thing. It, it's, 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 a, it's a fact. Um, homes get overwhelmed with cute kittens. Everyone wants their first litter. We just, we don't find this funny. We don't find it amusing. We find it very irresponsible. Um, the, the things that the community f faces every day in your backyards or when you're at work or when you're at the restaurants um, are the diseases that these animals spread to one another. The diseases, um, I mean, the fighting the inhumane, cruel deaths that these animals um, experience, um, how they affect owned cats that are outdoors. Um, all these things are things that we need to consider as a community. Um, what we want to do for a resolution is we want to increase the spay-neuter ad adoptions, and we want to do it in a real way for the real facts of this community. There are options here in Brockton. Animal Control has been wonderful at bringing in um, a particular spay-neuter clinic. The Animal Rescue League has been involved in bringing in a spay-neuter clinic. Um, unfortunately, the reality is for every cat that we spay and neuter, five or more are either brought into the city or are born. So we're not, we're not able to um, aggressively attack this problem. We need to increase this. And that's what we're here to basically speak to the, the, the city um, about is we're looking to find out how the city can become more of a part of this serious epidemic that's not going to end and it, and, it, and it leads to many, many, many serious community situations. Um, we're looking to find out if we can um, look into any city property, any city um, incentives, any city programs that can help us um, open up a low-cost, high-volume spay-neuter clinic here in the city. Um, I'm going to throw out something that, again, I'm, I have not done a lot of research. I'm a volunteer. I have my own job, my own family. Um, but I can tell you that we have colonies um, all around the community. Um, I'm, we don't like to always tell people because you worry about the um, animals being you know, injured by those people who don't want them around. Um, but I will mention one because it's pretty well known on Otter, um, Goddard and Ellsworth. There's a corner there. It's a vacant lot. It was at one point I discussed with the previous mayor about using that as a location potentially to put something. The, um, at that time, it was being used for gar the garden club or the garden club had just been <coughs> allowed to do something there. 
Unfortunately, we've been there since then still in the garden. You know, that has not really developed into much of anything that way. And we again would like that particular property be, to be considered. Again, I don't know any of the logistics on whether it's even viable, but I'm just throwing that out there as a place that we exist already. Um, as far as the community, the community is very aware that these cats are there and, and they're actually are very supportive um, of, they care, they do care. They, they may not spay and neuter, but um, they do care. So that it's definitely something the community has already seen. Um, I know we had mentioned, um, talked before one time about animal control property. Again, um, I know Tom you know, supports this, these efforts. Um, he you know, has, has not looked into any of that. And I know um, there's a representative from animal control who may or may not know also whether or not that's even an option. But again, we're not looking necessarily to be in the building. We're looking to bring in possibly a very inexpensive type of a uh, modular home type thing, placing it on some property that we're allowed to be on so that we can start initiating this, um, the incentive for spay neuter. Um, we have a lot of different, uh, the, the little sheet I gave everybody, there's a lot in there as far as different options. Um, yes, there are some financial options. Obviously, we would welcome any of those from the city. However, I think there's a lot that we can do to support the financial end. For example, rabies clinics, more um, prominent rabies clinics, and using those funds as part of to support a spay-neuter fund, setting, a, setting aside an, a spay-neuter fund that's just for spay-neuter. Um, also doing things like microchipping, which is again another positive thing for our animals in the community, using that as a fundraiser, dog washes. But again, the importance is, is to have the city involved, letting us use um, um, you know, different venues um, to be able to post things as part of the schools, things in the libraries, the websites, making it more of a city effort in addition to just being the people in the community or the individuals. So we are looking to try to see what, what else we can get. We're open to ideas for incentives. For example, having business owners maybe lease um, us property, but there may be a tax incentive or some type of an incentive. And um, we're looking for ideas and, and things to, to help us help the community. I don't live here in Brockton. I want to be here in Brockton because the animals, I, I've received calls from this community for uh, many, many years. So I, I feel that this is a community that has a problem and I'm willing to be here and help out the problem, but the city needs to acknowledge the problem so we can solve it as a community. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that we start now. We don't wait. We, we start trying to make some changes and start making some progress forward and I'm looking for the city to help with ideas, suggestions, possibilities um, on this. Unfortunately, for anyone to say, great, good job, Marsha, go for it, go get them. It's, that's, that's not the, what I'm looking for. Um, a pat on the back right now is not gonna resolve the problem. We need a little more aggressive, proactive um, action from the community, or from the city to support the, the community's actions. Um, at first, I was thinking um, that we wanted to push forward into some type of a spay-neuter ordinance, but reviewing the spay-neuter ordinances of other states and other communities, the bottom line is you need a, a spay-neuter option, a viable spay-neuter option in order to even remotely be able to take on any um, ordinance in regards to spay-neuter. And I think that's where we need to focus, and that's what we're looking to try to find ideas, suggestions, options, or where we go from here. Mr. President. Thank you. Council. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here, Marsha. I'm still going to pat you on the back. Good job. Because I have been that person that has all the cats getting sick and having problems and having kittens and having to look at them dead on the road and having to have neighbors that have caught up kittens in their lawn mowers because they were just born. And it's traumatic. Mm -hmm. And all you have to really do is do trap, neuter, release for one summer and you kind of can skate for a couple years years and then you take it again you can skate for a couple of years and they are cute and you can help find them homes so in the past I have spoken with um, Mr. Tuchelis about the addition onto the animal control or if animal control were to be moved to incorporate this um, spay neuter release program I know in California where my mother-in-law is from you go there to the animal control and it is operated by a volunteer body so the animal control officers do what they're supposed to do out in the community <coughs> operated by a volunteer group and they offer spay neuter and release for spay spaying for five dollars and um, 
you can adopt a cat for five dollars there. So there are models that we can do, and it would help the community. Right. So I'm I'm really willing to work with you on that. I can't wait to hear what my fellow counselors think of it, and hopefully this will be a jumping off point. I understand with people being murdered and these other things, there are things that are more important. But I think that we can you know walk and chew gum at the same time and try to help this group. Um, all they're asking for is space so they can bring in other groups to help do more tr spay, neuter, and releasing here and really helping poor people to spay and neuter their own animals. Exactly. What's, what's unfortunate in the community that we, work, that we work with is you can put a spay, neuter van as we do in the animal control, which does a great job at, at what the people who do go there. However, we find what we really do is we go to your door. We're at your door. You can... I walk into so many people's homes who are sitting on their couch watching their big screen TV as I walk in and go, excuse me, can I just sneak in and get your cat that you wanted me to spay and neuter and bring it to the clinic? Because they're not going to do it. But, but that's, that's the reality of it, and, I, and I'm not going to... Um, that's the reality. And so having just a vehicle posted up at Massasoit, which we have with the Animal Rescue League, once a month is not doing the job or we wouldn't have this continual problem. We would see a downslope of, of animals and, and it's not happening yet. So at this time, I'd just like to open up um, the floor to any of my other counselors that have questions. But I can promise you as a takeaway, I will work on this and I will talk to the mayor who has been really open to innovative approaches to see if there's some way we can work this out. So thank you. Any questions? Counselors, any other questions for Ms. Mata? That was a very detailed. Thank you very much thank for you. your time and your patience as thank well. You. Counselors, if there's no thing, I want to entertain a motion. If there's no I'd other like motions. Move to approve. Recommendation. Thank motion you. was Second. made. Favor recommendation. Uh, properly seconded. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. It's a favorable recommendation back to the council. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Let's see, uh, Madam Clerk, we're going to go to number three, please. Order appropriation $304,632 from the available funds Brockton's share of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Winter Rapid Recovery Road Program, WRRRP, for fiscal 2014 to the WRRRP project funds to provide funding for the purpose of eligible project costs as described in the attached communications. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, Chief Financial Officer, Michael Thorson, DPW Commissioner. Commissioner, good evening. Good evening, Councillors. How are you? Good, thank you. This program is, um, as it states, the Winter Rapid Recovery Road Program, or WRRRP. Sounds like a radio station, doesn't it? <laughs> um, what this is is a, uh, a grant from the, um, from the state, and it's to be used as almost like a Chapter 90. In other words, we hire, we have people come in, do road work for us, and then we pay them down just like we pay out of the Chapter 90 fund. So there's no money up front cost to the city, but it is a grant to us, so we are here to ask you to please approve same. Move to approve. Second. On the motion? On the motion, Council Cruz. Uh, this is great. We saw, all saw this in the newspaper a couple of weeks ago that the state was putting this money out, and I think I had six phone calls within about 20 minutes. So what do you, I see in, a, in the district that we're in, we're the, getting the most amount of money, which is great. What, uh, what are you planning on doing? Well, right now what we've done is uh, I've had discussions with the mayor on it and we are uh, making some determinations of what we're going to do with it. Um, I've sent my staff members out to survey the city streets. Uh, we're looking at areas that we've got a real high uh, concentration of claims uh, and things of that nature. But I've had conversations with the, with the mayor and we have not made a decision or he hasn't made a decision yet exactly how he wants to expend these funds. but. Uh, uh, once we do, I'm sure we'll uh, publicize it to all the councilors so they know what we're, what we're planning on doing with it. Good. So I'll just give the mayor's office number tomorrow when, I, <laughs> when we get the calls. Uh, okay. Thank you. And then just a little leeway, if I could, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, has West Elm Street, which is a state project, has that gone out uh, to bid yet? It's been advertised, and uh, the bid process, I believe, uh, was held up due to the fact that they hadn't passed the transportation bond bill. So uh, I expect it to be bid and awarded by the end of this summer. Hopefully they'll start like they did on Pleasant Street last year. Hopefully they can get it awarded and get it started like they did Pleasant Street last year, starting moving the poles and, and, and that kind of stuff, and then come in like they're doing on Pleasant Street now, sidewalks <coughs> and paving and things of that nature. So nation. we won't see any paving this year? Oh, not this year, no. 
Brown. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Council, the motion was made. It was probably oh, second. Uh, I'm sorry, on the motion, um, just Council one Bonds. question. To be eligible for this money, do you have to prove or have some kind of um, documentation that the roads or the signage or any of the identified um, places that the mon money's targeted for was damaged by the winter conditions? Or can you just mm, submit anything that's kind of messed Not up? necessarily, no, you don't have to. They're just, I think the assumption is most of the roads were damaged this year. So by it, shoveling and Yeah, and so plow. yeah. It's, okay, right. thank you. Thank you, Council. Again, a motion was made. It was properly second. A favorable recommendation back to the Council. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. Councilors, I'm going to uh, ask uh, someone to make a motion to take number four Mr. and Chairman, five collectively. So moved. Second. Motion was made. Properly second to take four and five collectively. All in favor, raise your hands. All opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Madam Clerk, number four and number five collectively. Order that the Mayor B and hereby is authorized to purchase on behalf of the city the property located at 60 Crescent Street, Map 110, Route 036, Plot 3, for the purchase price of $500,000, and further ordered that the mayor is authorized to execute and deliver a purchase and sale agreement and any other documents that may be necessary to carry out the purposes of this order. Order that the $500,000 is appropriated to pay costs of purchasing the former Crescent Credit Union building located at 60 Crescent Street and for the payment of all costs incidental and related thereto and that to meet this appropriation, the treasurer with the approval of the mayor is authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to chapter 44, section 73 of the general laws or pursuant to any other enabling authority and to issue bonds or notes of the city, therefore, invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, Philip Nazarella, City Solicitor, Martin Brophy, Treasurer, Tax Collector. To make it even. Oh, thank you. Uh, so this item, uh, if I'll give you the overview, and then we've got some other folks here to answer specific questions, but the building that's referenced here is the former Liberty Bank that was the former Crescent Credit Union directly across the street from the school department uh, Crosby Administration building just on the other side of the drive from the parking garage and right near City Hall. Um, I believe that there is a unique opportunity to acquire this building right now uh, and that it makes a tremendous amount of sense for the city to do so. Um, obviously the location is unique. There's no other building that's right between City Hall and um, the school department building. Uh, it will also tie in very nicely with the new City Hall Plaza that will be coming, that we'll be breaking ground on the third week of May, that with the acquisition of this building, we will in essence create a government center downtown with the parking garage, the Crosby building, this building, and City Hall, all framing a brand new four and a half million dollar park that's going to be built in between. Um, there is a real need for the building, it's unique acquisition, um, because we have a need for it on both the school side and the city side. Uh, we've been looking at this building for a while, it's been vacant for a while, back in my former role as chair of the facilities committee on the school committee, we were looking at this building year and a half, two years ago. It originally came on the market for I think $850,000, it's had two or three price reductions, uh, it was down to 650, and we were able to acquire it for 500 in negotiations. And we we negotiated very hard. We actually walked away from the table at one point to get the the lowest price we possibly could. Uh, the planned use for the building is twofold, um, and this is a cooperative effort between the city side and the school side. Um, the on the school side, the Crosby administration building is bursting at the seams. Uh, and the school department would like to relocate the parent information center into this um, building at the bank. That will be a dramatic improvement in the accessibility for these services to parents uh, from the city. Right now, the parent information center is in the basement at the rear of the Crosby administration building. It's extremely difficult to find. The parking over there, people tend to park there and get tickets, I can't tell you just in my three and a half months, how many complaints I've had from people who got tickets while they were registering their child for school. Um, I think that particularly for parents who are coming in that may not be fluent in English, it's even harder to find. Um, and the advantage here, not just creating the additional space right across the street, 
but now you're talking about a retail type of location with signage. It's a beautiful building uh, with sufficient off-street parking. So someone will see a sign very clearly on Crescent Street, be able to pull in and park in the parking lot uh, right there. The other half of the building uh, will be used by the Board of Health, um, an office that I used to work in. The Board of Health is located kind of at the rear of the Career Works Rockland Trust building on the other side of City Hall. And it may not be quite as tough as to find as the Parent Information Center, but it's certainly not easy to find and it's not convenient. And people struggle with getting in there to, to get services at, at the counter there also. Um, at the end of the day, in addition to the needs for this, the numbers work right now. Um, we're in a position where the lease has expired on the Board of Health as of June 30th. And so we walk away from there with, we do not incur any costs by moving the Board of Health out of the Career Works building. And the lease money that we're paying right now, currently for the Board of Health, and I'm gonna let the CFO go over the exact figures for you, but the lease money that we're paying now is more than what the bond payment will be to buy the Liberty Bank building. So it's actually a small cash flow savings. We own this building for less than the rent on the Board of Health right now at double the space, acquiring an asset rather than paying rent to a private property owner and improving services to the constituents at the same time. So I think it really makes sense on a lot of levels and from the city side, by partnering with the school side and sharing this space, it's what really makes the numbers work from the city side, because on the city side, we're simply going to handle the debt service on the building, and the school department is going to assume all of the utilities and maintenance and ongoing expenses of the building in return for using one side of it. So we own it for less than we're paying for rent for just the Board of Health right now. We acquire a building in a very unique, perfect position for us to really have a positive impact downtown. We fill a vacant building. Um, we provide better services with off-street parking. So I, I think there's an overwhelming case that uh, there's an opportunity to do something really good here. And it's a one-time opportunity. If we don't move on it, at some point, someone else is going to purchase it and it may never become available again. So. I, I, that's my overview of my reasons why I would ask you to please uh, recommend this favorably. And uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mr. Condon. We also have uh, Mr. Petronio, Mr. Thompson here from the school side uh, to answer any questions uh, specifically to the, the building and uh, their use of their portion of it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Council Barnes, do you have a question before Mr. Condon speaks? Or? Um, actually, no, he might okay. actually address Thank you, some Mr. Condon. of the issues. Okay, uh, councilors, I actually I recommend this. That, that you've got a certification letter. Uh, I think the mayor's described the reason it makes sense, uh, the, the, just physically the geographic uh, location of it. The Board of Health is paying over $40,000 a year in lease right now, and I think if it were to continue, it would be 45 or 46. The cheapest way to finance this would be to borrow the money uh, and repay the borrowing off with level principal payments and declining interest payments as opposed to like a mortgage where the payment's the same every year. So the maximum payment would be in the first year and that would be less than $40,000 at present interest rates. So you have a small savings between the, the cost of the first year's bond uh, debt service versus uh, the lease payment and that savings would grow every year because your interest payments would be going down. And as the mayor said, this opportunity is, is available because it's a kind of distressed sale by the owners who are looking to move the building and we're able to get a very, very favorable price for it and it helps to anchor the City Hall Plaza project. And so I recommend it. Council Bond. Oh, okay, Followed yes. by Council Cruz after you, Council. Thank you. Um, not sure who it's for, but I, I guess I'll just, actually, uh, Mr. Mayor, if you could. Uh, you mentioned that building has been several things um, in, in your recollection. I, well, re I recall it being a few things as well. Press and Credit Union and then Liberty Bank is what I immediately recall. Right, yeah, there, there, I think there was, there was some other, something else, but um, several businesses have failed in that location. Uh, and I mean, I've never really asked why. But in your negotiation, um, was it discussed why that happened? Is, is there something wrong, I guess, with the location or with no, the actually, building? Or? No, I'm glad you brought that up. So let me uh, comment on that. Um, 
Actually, Crescent Credit Union replaced it with a bigger building that they built. The Liberty Bank building, that was Holbrook Cooperative that began this Liberty Bank venture. They ran into some regulatory issues with it and shut it down. Um, when Holbrook Cooperative acquired it, mm -hmm. and as part of putting the Liberty Bank in, they did a substantial improvement in the building. And we've had both the, Mr. Kasiri from the city side and on the school side, the building department have done multiple inspections. They put, um, they bought it for, Aldo, what did they buy for 800? Yeah, they bought it for over 800,000 and they put another over 700,000 in updates and improvements into it after they bought it. So they're in the building for about 1.5 million. Um, we've been through the building top to bottom, uh, both on the city and school side. It's going to require some very minor alterations, minimal costs that we're going to fund out of current money that uh, is actually going to be paid on the school side. Um, and so, I mean, you've got a building that the bank is into for about $1.5 million uh, that we have a chance to acquire for now for half a million. Um, and as I said, we did negotiate very hard. They were originally looking for eight fifty dollars for it. I think they're just at the point that... Uh, they're, they're just looking to liquidate it at this point. They're going to take a big loss on it no matter what. They just want to get out of it and walk away. They do incur ongoing costs that the longer they hold on to it, they pay for security there. They still pay for utilities there. Um, so it makes sense for them to, to be able to unload it at this point, which I think is what really creates a great opportunity for us. The building is in, in beautiful condition. I'll let either of the facilities people uh, here comment on it. but. Uh, the building is in great condition, and we're only looking at doing some very minor alterations to it to make it suit our purposes. Okay, and um, so this building is not on the uh, that uh, abandoned buildings list. No. Okay. All right. So no, I mean it's vacant, um, but uh, it's you know the you know the bank has been maintaining it properly and and all that and. Uh, you know, we're certainly, if, if any councilors would like to see and go for a walk through it, you know, we have spoken to the broker and we'll be happy to schedule a date and time for any councilors would like to walk through. And I'm sure we could do that prior to next Monday if you'd like to. And, and just actually two more. Um, the public safety complex or unit or whatever has been discussed in, in the city for some time, um, comprising of the police the DA, fire, and all those other kind of public safety uh, departments. That wasn't considered for that. I understand that it's small. Oh, it's way too small. Right. I understand that it's small, but just even in a, in a beginning stage to maybe put some offices there for, for that, um, like a chief's officer, you know, um, I, something I, like that. But anything else? I just don't think it's it even there. close to being suitable for that. It's not that big of a building. I think where it's located and the size of it, I think we really are finding its, finding its highest and best use, and that is bringing the Parent Information Center and the Board of Health in there. That's going to substantially improve our services that we're offering to the residents, both parents registering kids for school and folks that are looking to access the Board of Health. Okay, and one more thing. I attended the luncheon today. Mm -hmm. um, over I'm sorry, <laughs> I got tied up and I didn't make it. That's okay. Um, and in addition to the wonderful lunch that I had at the Brockton uh, Fine Arts Cafe, um, th there were some uh, challenges that were presented to us about the, the funding and the budget coming up for the school departments. And even just now, um, CFO Condon said that they will be looking at layoffs regardless of whatever else happens in the city. And if I understood you correctly, you just said something about these payments will be paid from the school budget? No. So to allay your fears, first of all, there's no cash flow cost to this on the city side. All we're doing is taking the rent that we're privately paying to the owner of the Career Works building for the Board of Health. We're taking that, so I think it's 43000 this year, 47000 next year, and we're using that cash flow of the 40000 a year to purchase this building. Right, but what did you say that the school department would pay for? The school department is going to pick up the maintenance and utilities in return for getting half the space in the building for the Parent Information Center. Now, will that be in addition to their current responsibilities to, to the current school buildings and properties that the Department of Education has, or the school department has, in addition? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and they're but facing layoffs. I think that it's a very minimal expense in return for what 
the space is providing for the uh, the parent information center that also offers I'll let this Mr. Petronio address it from the school side because I'm not on that side anymore other than being chairman of the school committee but um, I believe that it's a great deal for them also because they desperately need more space for administration also and that by moving the parent information center across the street it improves the services to the families and at the same time it's now going to free up that space in the the bottom floor of the administration building where they can uh, move some other things in but specifically what they have planned for it I'll defer to the school people okay actually yeah if, if they could okay. step forward and I know good evening Councilor. good evening good evening um, and you were at the meeting today as well just just actually one thing before you go on to that actually no go ahead okay I think the focal point of the meeting today was aside from the fact that our revenues aren't growing fast enough our student population is. Our student population is growing at such a rate that we're expanding not only in our central administration but also in the amount of classroom space that we need in the city. So no matter what, even if we didn't acquire this building, we still need additional space. So we would have to go on the open market and probably rent something somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, we had rented on, on Main Street and then we brought that in-house and tried to make it work. But we have lines out the door. We have a, a waiting area that is so full of people that literally they're outside the building waiting to get in, register their students. So for us, that's you know, a safety concern, and the fact that all these um, individuals that come down have no place to park. So um, this is a perfect solution. I think there's 32 parking spaces there, uh, plus the fact that the building is large enough to accommodate um, a large influx of people when, you know, when the registrations start happening. So with staff and visitors, that reduces the amount of parking, because that's what happened at the courthouse. When they made the courthouse, there's a, there were like 300 and something uh, employees there, and they had like 100 and something spaces. So they already started at a space deficit. Right. All the employees will park in the city lots or the parking garage. Okay. And that'll leave pretty much every space uh, open in this building. We'll have a couple of spaces set up for the, the, the transient business of the Board of Health, where the inspectors come in, drop off the paperwork, and go back right. out. So we'll have a couple of reserves for that. Um, but the rest will be open for parents okay. and for and you know, customers of the Board of Health. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Council Cruz. Thank you. Uh, actually, most of my questions have been answered, but I do uh, maybe Ken Thompson for a second. <coughs> I, did, I meant to ask to have Mr. Kassiri here tonight, but uh, I know your background. You've been in the building. Um, we have enough trouble keeping taking care of the buildings we have, but uh, the, the, uh, the systems inside, HVAC, uh, electrical. We've looked through the systems, looked through the building, and the building's in relatively good shape, and as been said before, about four years ago, we underwent quite a renovation. So the building itself is in good shape. Um, we have maintenance programs we establish in each of our buildings in order to maintain the equipment, and we do the same thing in this building as well. So you're pretty comfortable with the quality of the building? Yes. Okay, and then I just have one question for Mr. Condon, I think. Uh, you know, theoretically, I'm in favor of this because it's basically revenue neutral, but uh, um, except that down the road, 10 years, 20 years, we have another building that we will have trouble taking care of, but in the meantime, the rents could be going up, yeah. continue to go up across the street. Uh, talk to me about net school spending and how, how much will be applied to uh, net school spending and how will you do that? Well, this, this building, um, the cost that are the school department's cost will be net school spending because uh, it'll be an owned facility and the utility cost uh, is in support of education. It's the parent. Uh, so, parent. so whatever they spend will go against net school spending. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Cruz. Councilor, uh, oh, Councilor Azak. Good evening. Uh, this question is for Mr. Thompson. I know that you, good evening. Thank good evening. you for being here tonight. Um, I know you said the building's in great condition and everything's working, but I believe it's not walk-in ready. You might have to do some renovations on the, to make it ready to hold these two different departments. I mean, how much do you figure it would cost to well, renovate we, we it? Do, we do all of those renovations in-house using our own staff. So it'll be minimal. Uh, it'll be the cost of materials plus the labor to do it. It'll be a final design for the Parent Information Center. We may have to build out a couple of additional offices for them and some outside work. But basically, it's pretty much moving ready. Okay. So you don't see any large No large cost. expenditures, no. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh. Can I follow up on that? Uh, we'll sorry. get back to you, Councilor. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Councilor Dubois. 
Thank you. Um, mine isn't really a question, I'm sorry. But I am gonna support this. I think it's a great idea. I commend the mayor for finding it and bringing it before us. It's a wonderful way to get that Board of Health out of that insane office that is just not big enough for them and move them into property that we own while we're building ownership and then down the road we can sell it and maybe even regain the 500000 that we're investing uh, to purchase the building. So I think it's a really great idea, so close to City Hall and the school department, to build that campus environment. So thank you very much. I think it's a great idea. Thank you, Council. Council Stewart. Uh, question for um, Mr. Condon. Just what are we losing in tax revenue since it, it was previously a for Profit. Well, the, the taxes on the building are probably about $15,000 a year, but that won't be revenue lost to the city. Uh, the way the tax assessment works, it's a levy that's divided about a, a, among all the properties. So basically every commercial taxpayer in the city will pay an extra dollar. Okay, thank you. Council Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thompson. Um, oh, by the way, I, I did check on the taxes. I think last year they paid $16,000 in taxes. 16. Mr. Thompson, how are we, um, we going to separate the, the Board of Health uh, clientele from the Parent Center clientele, knowing that that building is basically, at least the way it was operated in the past, it was a, a single building? Uh, are we going to separate it in a way so there's, that... There's two separate entrances to the building. I, I know there are two separate entrances, right. but the building itself was one building. because I, I That's correct. Right. So we're going to build up some walls and stuff like that and separate the two, or are they there's, just going to be There's an open? area where there's a handicap ramp going down that conceivably could have a door set up if that need be the case. But right now it's the Board of Health in the back and the front entrance is for the Parent Information Center. Well, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I can, I can see a bunch of you know, five-year-olds, four-year-olds running around into the area occupied by the Board of Health. And before you know, we're gonna have some, some issues. Uh, is there any way that the, those two um, entities could be somewhat separated so that, you know, the children from the, the registration side of things aren't going or actually having access to the Board of Health or, in, in a way, intermingling between uh, the two clientels that are, uh, are going to be utilizing the building? I certainly think we could look at that in that position that I talked about where that door could potentially be installed. We'd have to look at that once occupancy took place. In um, working with WB Masons and laying out the building and the furniture, they've even suggested that that hallway that leads it down there is wide enough to actually have two secretarial desks there uh -huh. that actually could act as a buffer to that area. So that would um, be a natural deterrent for kids to go through. Yeah, because as we were discussing earlier today at the luncheon, um, the building itself only has one bathroom upstairs. Um, well, it has a, a, a men's room and a ladies' room upstairs, well, but also in the basement there's a men's and a ladies' room. Right, but in reality only has one bathroom. Uh, if you have a men's and a woman's, it, technically it's one, one bathroom. So you're going to have one side of the building traveling into, into the other side, and that's the reason why I'm bringing this up, because I can, I can see you know, three months down the road when the building is fully operational, you're going to have... Uh, individuals complaining about chances are it's going to be against the kids uh, especially when you have bilingual uh, non-english speaking kids running around doing all what kids normally do uh, you're going to have some some folks who are at the board of health doing the board of health business uh, voicing their complaints loudly so if there's something that we could do to avoid that from from even becoming a problem I would highly uh, recommend that we do that I think if we found it to be an issue it, for us to install a, um, you know, a bathroom wouldn't be a large task. We have our plumber on staff and the city has two plumbers on staff and we have electricians, so. But, but in a way, I guess what I'm saying is to basically separate the, you know, separate the two entities since your clientele isn't the same. You know, to somehow physically separate it so that the children are not running into the you know, Board of Health clients and, or vice versa. So to create a barrier so that those two aren't mixing. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, as we've looked at the building, that's been some discussion. Um, I don't believe the Parent Information Center right now even has any bathrooms at all. Uh, so, you know, for the public. So um, this will 
be more accessible and have more bathrooms than where the parent information center is right now. The, where the customer service area is going to be for the Board of Health will be at the other extreme end of the building from where the reception area will be. So there's quite a bit of space in between, but I think that we could take your recommendation and there was some discussion of maybe like a half wall or something uh, to be a, a more permanent divider and I, I think that's doable for not a lot of money. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank you, Mr. Mayor, for bringing this forward. This is, we talked about this right after you got elected. I mean, this is a good thing for the city. It's definitely a good thing as an amenity to the school side as well. And it, it, even though it's half a million bucks, it's short money long term. As my grandmother used to say, God rest her soul, God's not making any more real estate. So, yeah. <laughs> and you'd know this from your prior life. So, well, uh, it's, a, it's a great building in great condition in a very strategically right. advantageous uh, location for That's us, right. but I appreciate your thoughts, Thank Mr. You. President. Thank you. Entertain a motion. Move motion. to approve. Motion made properly. Second, a favorable recommendation of agenda items number four and five collectively. All in favor, raise your hands. All opposed, those motions carry. Uh, we're going to go to number six now, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Order that the Brockton DPW is authorized to issue a single family home sewer connection to DEC Realty Trust for the lot of land located at 0 Aim Street, Map Route. 164242, Plot 51, invited Michael Thorson, Commissioner DPW, David Elman, resident. Mr. President. Council. I spoke with um, Mr. Thorson um, as he left, and he said that this uh, sewer connection will not um, overtax any of the um, sewer interceptors that overflow on a regular basis. So move with that approve. knowledge, I move thank I second. Thank you very a much. Motion made properly. Second, favorable recommendation. All in favor, raise your hands. All opposed, motion carries. Number six is favorably recommended back to the council. Number seven, I think it's the final agenda item tonight. Yes. Order that the city solicitor's office will provide an update to members of the city council and executive session on any and all pending litigation on a quarterly basis beginning May 2014 and continuing every four months, August and November 2014. Invited Philip Nazarella, city solicitor. Good evening, Attorney Nazarella. Good evening. The night is almost over, sir. <laughs> Counselor. Counselor. Let's make this quick. Right. So I'm I, all for that. I spoke with Mr. Uh, Attorney Nessarella about this issue after um, the arrest hit, uh, well, after the settlement um, with the family um, hit with the police department. I think that most of my fellow counselors know that uh, the city went to court um, because a family sued the police for excessive force and there was decision and correct me if I'm wrong that the city has to pay thirty thousand dollars plus the um, legal fees for the family um, that took the city to court so that made me think if I had known and I had gotten a list from the law department of all the um, litigation within the law department a couple months prior if I had known that that lawsuit was moving forward I think I would have um, I mean I don't I don't know how much effect I would have had, but I would have discussed it with, tried to discuss it with the city solicitor and try to encourage um, some kind of a settlement that may have been less costly than the one that was decided. And I just would have liked to have known about it before it hit the newspaper with the decision. So that was my motivation for putting this on. Um, and I know that in Taunton they do do this type of um, updates to city council in executive session. So I spoke with Mr. So, um, city Solicitor Nessarella, and he said that he'd be willing to do that, but that was just a phone conversation. And I put it on the agenda. And I think that after some um, deliberation on your part, you may have changed your mind. And I'm just right now wanting to know what you think of this, and if this won't work, what can you do that you think would be effective? Well, I think it's a good idea to um, be receptive to the city council and keep them informed as to what the array of uh, litigation is that's out there. There is uh, a slight inaccuracy into the description of that recent case you made. Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, I'm in favor of it from our previous conversation to the extent of stating to you what the cases are that are pending, what the nature of the case is, uh, if it's a tort case, uh, police abuse, if it's a slip and fall, those, those types of uh, matters. To go in any, in any further depth, I would probably be breaching, I, I would be you know, straddling a line of breaching some ethical obligations. And I quite frankly don't think I would be in favor of discussing whether we should settle or not settle, because those determinations are based upon 
what we believe may be the gravity, a lack of gravity of the case. Uh, there are a number of variable factors when you settle a case, not only whether or not you can win it or lose it, but if there's a public policy uh, involved, if witnesses are available, if our strategy may or may not work, et cetera, et cetera. And those are between, uh, sometimes take place as what we call attorney-client privilege. So it's not, the call is not made by uh, third parties. In fact, uh, with this mayor and prior mayors, none of them have invaded that area of our decision making, whether or not we should settle, and if we do, to what extent should we go to arbitration or mediation before litigation. There are a number of uh, exits on the road we can sometimes take or not take. Uh, so I don't, I think it would be rather dangerous to get into that area, but certainly well within the um, um, forum of a city council to at least know what we have for cases out there. Yeah, and I appreciate it. And I think that maybe I misspoke um, with that just now. So I, overall, with the costs of outside legal counsel and the discussion from the mayor and in yourself about the, the, the increasing costs of outside legal counsel, I think it would be beneficial for the council to at least know. And I think just I've gotten lists before, and your office has been extremely helpful keeping me informed in list form of what's going on but not being an attorney and not getting even those rudimentary updates of this is a slip and fall or this is that I wasn't able to really understand anything beyond the names on the page so I appreciate that so what I did this evening is I put this in as an order um, not an ordinance so it would expire at the end of 2014 and if uh, we as a city council wanted to re-up it, we could. Or if we wanted to make it an ordinance and make it a permanent fixture, we could. So it really gives us a lot of latitude to have three updates and then come back and say, this was either beneficial to us, we feel more informed, or this is really not so much a good use of our time as a body and not um, continue it in 2015. So I just brought that to you guys' attention for my fellow city councilors to discuss it and see what they think. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. And of course, we have our Legislative Council here as well tonight. Um, any, any other questions? I have Council one, Bonds, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Mr. Nizrella, Attorney Nizrella, would, would you be, uh, I, I guess, less, um, less hesitant to share with us some of the, the goings on in the law department if we were just to ask maybe for um, not the strategy that uh, the attorneys are taking in the case, but um, you know, if we defer to your experience and to the experience that you have in dealing with cases, just kind of where these cases are going, um, and maybe some of the, the ones, like, uh, uh, like Councilor Dubois said, maybe some of the ones that might be problematic, bringing those to the council attention, not all of the litigation that goes on, because then I think, I fear, it would probably turn into um, something that would no longer be beneficial for information purposes only. Um, but just would, would that be something that you'd be willing to do? Yeah, I, don't I don't have any hesitancy about uh, doing something along that nature. And I, we do try, as a matter of policy, to inform an individual counselor of a, uh, a, a matter which is pending within the award or emanated from the award so they're aware of it in case it becomes uh, somewhat of a neighborhood concern. Um, we have no hesitancy at all in communicating. It's just that we don't want to get too close to that third rail sure. about what we are allowed to discuss uh, to third parties and what we are not allowed to discuss. Sure. Okay. And I mean, definitely sharing the ones that you know the news trucks are sniffing around Main Street for, right? Oh, absolutely. I have no problem, in, uh, and I think many of you know I've I've always been very open and and proactive on giving you that information. Thank you, sir. Councilor Cruz. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, I, I thank Council Dubois for bringing this forward, but I'm hesitant to vote for this as an order. Um, number one, I hate the idea of us going into executive session, but there are times we have to. But uh, also, as elected officials, I'm hesitant uh, about getting too close to any of those, to, to getting into the lawsuit with the legislative branch. And again, I appreciate what, what Council Dubois is is thinking, but too often we get called upon to referee as it is, and I think we could really start down a slippery slope if we were more aware of the inner inner workings of particular cases. That's why we have legal counsel, and uh, 
I know that uh, it could just it could lead to some some issues where we have constituents who are telling us one thing, but that may not be what the court case brings out, and we might tend to get a little too involved. It's just uh, I think human nature possibly to do that. So I appreciate your thought process behind this, but uh, and I do know that any time I've asked you for an update uh, in general on something that I know is going on out of your office, you've been your office has been wonderful about giving me the in as much information as I need. And uh, as a counselor, I don't really want to be, you know, we don't make decisions on that, on those things. And uh, I just know that my, myself, I'd probably try to say, oh, you should be doing this or doing that. And that's not right. That's why you're there. And that's why we have a, a solicitor's office. So I just, I, I do understand Councilor Dubois' thought process behind it. I just, I'm not very comfortable with it personally. So thank you. Thank you. Thank Councilor you. Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Nazarella, just... Just a point of information, how many cases, how many lawsuits are filed on a yearly basis against the city of Rockton? On average. Could be 30, 40. 30, 40 cases a year? Yeah. And how many cases are litigated on a yearly basis? Uh, sometimes it could range from 25 to 50%. And on your, on your estimation, how many of these cases do go in favor of the city? That's, that's difficult to say. I'm saying last year. How many of these cases did we lose? Uh, quite frankly, the track record has been better for the city than those who have sued. And I can state that for those, some listening may say, gee, uh, he litigates that much. Yes, we litigate very aggressively. We defend very vigorously because I do not want the reputation that it's an open door policy. Sue the city and they'll settle for something. So we do tend to uh, defend cases more vigorous, vigorously than we do uh, <clears throat> resolving them by way of settlement. But if we're just losing these cases, uh, perhaps we can cut back on our litigation in the sense. I mean, if. Some, some well, cases. you never know if you're going to lose a case until after it's over. If we feel there's a good faith defense and a meritorious defense to it, we, we uh, will defend it to its hilt. And um, what I'm telling you is that most of them are successful. But how many of these cases do you try to settle or arbitrate or do some things before you go to court? Because it seems All of that, them. I, I don't know, it seems that in the city of Brockton. Council, was the answer all of them? All of them. That's the answer. Council. Are they all of them? Yeah. All of them. We always are open to mediation, arbitration, discussion, some by order of court. We have to. We always have to extend ourselves to the 50 way, 50 yard line to try to resolve. But if there's a, a large impasse, we go forward to litigation. Do you find that quite a few of these cases get actually settled before they go to court? Some do, yes. Yeah. I mean, a decent number so or? Uh, a respectable number. Well, thank you, Mr. Nutt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Counselor, thank you. Uh, actually, um, Mr. Chair, one Counselor question. Stewart. Of, of the 40 or so cases per year, what percentage are civil rights related? Uh, maybe five to five to eight percent. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, entertain a motion. I'm going to move for a favorable recommendation. Second. Motion was made, and properly second in favor of recommendation. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Favor of recommendation back to the full city council. Councilors, before we conclude tonight, again, thank you, Attorney Nezarell. Thank you. Um, again, we're going to be here two nights here in this chamber, 7 o'clock, with our colleagues on the school committee and Mayor Carpenter. Please, uh, please be prompt. Uh, all the people that applied to uh, be considered will be here. And, uh, the rules and regulations will be spelled out at the beginning of the meeting. But please be here promptly on time. We will be starting at 7 o'clock as posted. Anything else before us? Uh, yes, Mr. President, if I may. Um, yes, there Tomorrow at uh, Vincente's Tropical Grocery Store, we have a great relationship with them, uh, with the city, and they're, they're expanding here. Tomorrow there's going to be a mass in motion uh, healthy market kickoff event 
Tuesday, May 6th from 1 to 2, again at uh, Vincenti's current location on 689 Main Street. And I'd just like to invite um, all the counselors and the audience and the folks at home to go down there and take advantage of this, uh, this great opportunity. Thank you, Council. Council Dubois. I have a motion of personal, and they have a motion of personal privilege. You may. I want to wish everybody happy Cinco de Mayo. Hey. It's one of my oh. favorite holidays. And Thank you. Thank you, Council. Council Hezak. Okay, I, a moment of personal privilege. Absolutely. I wasn't going to announce it because I didn't announce my oldest daughter's birthday, but tonight is my um, Georgina's birthday, which she's a Cinco de Mayo. Happy baby. birthday, Georgina. Yay. All right. Anything else before us? Meetings here by adjourned.